I said, plug me in. I got stuff to talk about, damn it. Damn it. Damn it. I'll call out of my earbuds once a week to give you a show. That's what I do, folks. I do this show for the common man, for the people in despair. I bring this show into the world and I sell it everywhere. The simple truth lies waiting here, folks, for all of you to share. Hold on, I will take you there. Hey, what's happening? Mike Smith, 40 year old boy. Brian Gans, it's a weird hey. You know why? Because I did hands. I actually did almost like jazz hands with that. Hey, what's happening? Um, now, is this next week's show or last week's show? What are we doing here? I don't even remember. This is two weeks from now, folks. We are, well, I tell you what, we are locked and we are, lo- this is episode nine? I'm lost. Uh, and also, I'm recording, I think it's like Monday. Dudes, we got a, a mess here. Because right now, as you listen to this, I think I'm in Milwaukee at a Rick Springfield concert and Lily's in Hawaii in a pineapple field. I think, I don't, see, this is the problem. We need a bigger staff at Mike Schmidt Incorporated. <laughs> Like, you know what? Mex should be doing the show this week. He really should, honestly, when you think about it. Because it's like, there's two of us and then Mex, but we're off. I mean, we, we punched out, man. We hit our clock. You and I are like the sheepdog and the coyote. We just said, chunk, chunk, morning, Ralph, morning, George. We fucking bailed, went to Hawaii and Milwaukee. And now Mex is still here holding down the fort. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I wish Mex was an audio expert. Because let me tell you something, folks. We've got problems here at Mike Schmidt Incorporated right now. Uh, to the point where... I'm starting to wonder if there's going to be a show uh, or so two. Good. Well, uh, I don't know about all that. Um, we just lost like two minutes of audio as I was talking. We didn't notice really that apparently uh, Lily's laptop is not working properly. The audio in, uh, we, we're trying to diagnose it. You know, for weeks we've been having this problem. Um, and I've had to stop and start and retake audio and things like that. And I'll tell you what, um, you're not going to care because a lot of you have real fucking jobs and you're moving furniture and you're throwing garbage into a truck or whatever the fuck you're doing. I don't know. However you handle your lives, it's fine. But every week I come here and I talk and I bitch about how hard it is sometimes. Well, because I'm kind of creating it on the fly and trying to make it happen and whatever the fuck happens, happens. Well, um, if you create something on the fly for four minutes and then all of a sudden it's gone and you have to try to recreate it or find a way to bring it back, uh, it's it's incredibly discouraging. And I know that sounds stupid. It shouldn't, but it does. Um, Cause again, just a second ago, there was like huge machinery outside. And I made an awesome joke about a snow plow and it was Christmas. And I mean, it was always oh, fucking great. <laughs> it was such a great joke. It was, it was really good. Wasn't it? Um, but the audio went out. So now we've had to stand down and we've just spent the better part of 45 minutes trying to figure out what's going on with the laptop. Um, so get this folks, here's what's happening as I record episode nine for your enjoyment. Um, Lily is holding the plug in the fucking laptop. (laughs) That is how we're recording. Now, you've listened to this show, so you know sometimes it's around two hours. Uh, Well, it takes about six hours to record two hours of audio, whether we're stopping, we're starting, we're talking, we're not, she's editing, and then she's got to edit, all sorts of bullshit. It takes a while. It's a process, folks. Um, And you know what? I shouldn't say it's six hours to record a two-hour show. That's just because we'll stop. It's not like I make six hours worth of mistakes and we got to fucking keep going. It's just I'll be talking, then I'll stop because I got to regroup and I got to have like, you know, fucking three yogurts, whatever the fuck I got to do. So there are. Well, recently... (laughs) Because remember when eating was for the week, I didn't do a fucking thing. But now I've I've wound up where I've got to have a yogurt. I'll have a granola bar in the middle of all this. And I'm just like, and it, you know what? It's also part of being a child because I'll be like, I want a granola bar. I can't talk anymore. And she's like, you can't have a granola bar until you're done talking. I'm like, oh, I want a granola bar. She goes, fine, I have a granola bar. And, uh, and then we have a slap fight. And then I sit down and we cry. And then we record in about an hour. But right now she's holding in the plug, folks. And I know that sounds like a euphemism, but it's not. Uh, and so we don't know if the audio is going to drop out or not. And so I kind of, and I'll tell you what, what's funny is I said to her, I go, well, you can't hold the plug in for four hours. And she goes, well, let's just go and see what happens. And all I'm doing is making it longer by talking. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I should be fucking doing something here, but I'm not. Um, Cause this week's show is a, is a clip show because uh, we've, we've had to record like a ton of shows in a small amount of time. And it just worked out better for Lily's schedule and for my schedule to go ahead and do a clip show. And also um, there are a lot of stories from from the past that I forget about. And then when I, I revisit them, I go, Jesus Christ, that's fucking hilarious. And I almost wish I had a chance to retell them. And I'll tell you what, when I start going out live, I'm going to start incorporating some of these stories into the live stuff. And, and it's stuff I'll tell you all about later when we start running the Kickstarter and we do all that stuff. But I, I will tell you this really quickly. Um, I was reviewing clips for this clip show last night, trying to find uh, <laughs> clips to use. And uh, I, I'm just going to say this. I'm not kidding. I almost jerked off to my own voice last night 
because of a story that I told. I'm not going to say which one it was. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into that. I will tell you it's not featured in the show. Actually bullshit. It is. It's this first clip. Uh, this first clip is a, uh, because look, we're in the middle of baseball season and the Phillies are awful. All right. The Phillies are terrible and they're not fun to watch. So I thought we would revisit 2008 when the Philadelphia Phillies won the world series. And, uh, I was in the throes of it being excited about that weeks and weeks and weeks. And we were analyzing it. Well, uh, when they first started their run to the title, I told this story and here's one of the reasons why I'm including this story. Uh, this story got nothing when I told it in year one. And I could not believe it because it was one of those stories that I've told my friends forever. And it's just one of those things that, you know, it happened when I was a kid and, uh, and it was just one of those go-to stories where you'd be drinking and it'd be like, you know, midnight and you're one in the morning and you're at your friend's house and they'd be like, Schmitty, tell the fucking Ron Say story. And, uh, and I would, you know, it's like the George Arnold story or the Seven Eleven story. These are, these are stories that became part of me and, and ingrained in who I was. So I told the story on the show and I did not receive a fucking email that week. And actually, if you buy year one, you can read the liner notes. And I bitched about it in the liner notes because I'm like, dude. This is like a legendary story from when I was a kid. And I'd been getting like 20 to 40 emails every week up until that point. And that week I got zero emails. Like nobody even responded at all to the entire episode, but let alone this fucking story, which to me, if I heard the story, I'd be like, this fucking story is the greatest, regardless of whether I was involved. Uh, so I fuck it. I want to, I want to revisit it because revisit, it's again, we're getting back with the Phillies are terrible. So let's go back to when they won the world series. And it also is a story that I think should have gotten a lot more the first fucking time I told it. So by all means, sit down and put fucking fingers to keyboard and write me and tell me how great this was. I mentioned this story last week and then people were, wrote me and were like, well, why didn't you tell that story? So I'll tell this story. This is just, and again, it's nothing. It's just brace yourself. There's uh, no, well, there's a payoff, but I don't know if it, you know, nobody gets hit. Let's put it that way. Everybody usually, in my story, uh, usually there's either just, you know, flying jizz or, or, or you know, somebody gets punched or, uh, or I wind up eating a, an entire roast. But th that doesn't happen in this story. This story is just, this is more along the lines of chunky A humiliation. So, uh, as a youth, uh, I became a Philadelphia Phillies fan in like 1976. I don't know, 75, because I was in Catholic school. Uh, and Sister Arlene said, hey, did you know that there's a guy named Mike Schmidt who plays for the Pittsburgh Pirates? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And then I immediately checked the newspaper and found out that she doesn't know anything about sports. <laughs> <laughs> she plays for the Philadelphia Phillies. So I, uh, I'm like, well, Christ, I'm a huge uh, Phillies fan now at eight years of age or seven years of age. And, uh, and then the Phillies would come to Chicago and I would see them, you know, Mike Schmidt owned Wrigley Field. It was so great to watch him. And so I've become, I've been a Phillies fan since I was a kid because of Mike Schmidt, the baseball player. So in 1983, when our hero was uh, 16, and that would be me, your hero, <laughs> I, uh, I was going to uh, go to Wrigley Field on Mike Schmidt's birthday, September 27th, 1983. Because I wanted to meet Mike Schmidt, and also that day, if the Phillies were to win, they would clinch a tie for the division title. Because that was the year that they had like Pete Rose and Joe Morgan and Tony Perez and and all these old guys, and they you know they made a miraculous run to the to the pennant. They actually went to the World Series that year. So I was going to go to Wrigley Field and meet Mike Schmidt. I said, "This is it. This is the day I go and I I meet Mike Schmidt, and I'll be like, hey, look, I'm Mike Schmidt. You're Mike Schmidt. Here's my name, your name. We're friends, and uh, aren't we great?" Uh, because when you're 16, you think that's going to happen. So uh, a family friend, like I couldn't, nobody would go with me. Uh, I, I forget, because we had school. I had to ditch school to go, basically. And I actually got permission from my mom to ditch school to go. I don't, because my mom was probably high. I have no idea why there was permission. But uh, a, a family friend named Eddie was going to take me down there. Uh, and by family friend, I mean junkie my mom knew. So... <laughs> He was a guy, he was one of my mom's friends who was in and out of jail. You know what I mean? We'd, we'd always hear, you know, hey, I don't know if you know about Eddie. He got drunk and hit a cop. Great. Uh, is he going to be out in time to take me to the cup game? So that, that was Eddie. Uh, so just Eddie and I go down to Wrigley, and we go early. So I actually meet the Phillies bus. So I'm going to meet Mike Schmidt, man. I'm there. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. The Phillies bus shows up. The Phillies come charging off the bus. That, that doesn't sound right. They didn't come charging off the bus. How weird would that be? They just come running. They come barreling through everybody, just throwing elbows like crazy moshers. No, they're, they're nice people, and they come off. And I meet Gary Maddox, and uh, I meet, I'm meeting Phillies. They're all very nice. Willie Hernandez, Guillermo Willie Hernandez is there, and I, get, uh, I meet him. 
Uh, he, he actually, I don't think, is a Philly at the time, but he winds up being a Philly later and winning the Cy Young Award, having an amazing year with the Phillies. He might have been a Cub at the time. I don't remember. But whatever, I, ha I still have his autograph on the ticket stub. Let's put it that way. So then Steve Carlton gets off the bus. Now, Steve Carlton is the greatest left-handed pitcher who ever lived. Ah, fuck you and your Sandy Koufax. So, uh, no, I'm sure Sandy Koufax is amazing. I didn't see him growing up. Warren Spahn, whatever. But, you know, for me, Steve Carlton was, uh, you know, the, the greatest left-handed pitcher I've, uh, you know, that I, besides Randy Johnson, whatever. I'm not going to get into this argument with anybody but myself. I love Steve Carlton. Let's put it that way. Steve Carlton, Hall of Fame left-handed pitcher. Also notorious for not talking to the press, ever. By the way, if you want to see an interesting picture of Steve Carlton, Google him and try to find the picture of him breaking an arrow against his neck. When I was a kid, that made a vivid impression on me. He literally, he was like a martial arts guy or he studied at like a TM or something and he takes an arrow and he puts it against his Adam's apple and he bends it and bends it and bends it and then it snaps. He breaks an arrow by pointing the arrow head into his throat and snaps it. That's how fucking tough Steve Carlton was, and that's why he's the greatest left-handed pitcher who ever lived. So, you know what? Take that, Randy Johnson, right in your face. Uh, so, take that, Randy Jones. He's not even in the argument. I just throw him in because it's fun. <laughs> Randy Jones, former San Diego Padre, had one good year, but yet I throw him into the best left-hander of all time mix. Why not? <laughs> Suck on that, Steve Trout. Uh, Steve Trout, by the way, will play a part in this story. So anyway, I'm at the I'm at the game. Steve Carlton gets off the bus. Notoriously hates the media. Doesn't talk to anybody. Gets off the plane. Uh, the the plane. Yeah, they landed a plane right outside of Wrigley. They taxied it in right by the the firehouse. Uh, right at the Cubby Bear. They on the helipad. So he uh, uh they they pull up in the bus. They get off. Steve Carlton gets off. Could not have been nicer. The nicest man. Stops. Talks to people. Signs autographs. Friendly smiling the entire time, just pleasant and wonderful to be around. And at the end, because all we hear about Carlton at the time is that he's this horrible, horrible guy, and he comes up and he's really friendly and nice. And uh, it's a good thing that he was friendly and nice because it provided cover for Mike Schmidt to run into Wrigley Field and not talk to anybody. I'm standing there, and I'm because I'm waiting for Mike Schmidt to get off the bus, and it's great to see these other guys that are all my heroes, and I, I love the Phillies, but I'm there to see Mike Schmidt. And uh, as I'm talking to Carlton, and I'm talking, and, and Steve Maddox is there, or I'm sorry, Gary Maddox is there, and uh, uh, everyone's very nice. Pete Rose stops and talks to people. Pete Rose is talking to people. Joe Morgan, they're all there. They're talking to people. John Denny, a nice man. And as they're greeting the fans, St Mike Schmidt gets off the bus and doesn't, he, get the, he just does this thousand yard stare, ignores everybody, and goes right into the fucking field, stadium. So I'm, I'm like, really? And I'm like, uh, Mr. Schmidt, and he's gone. He runs. And, uh, but everybody else is still friendly and nice. But the, here's the thing. I have an ace uh, in the hole. I've got a, uh, I'm there early, so I'm there for batting practice. I have seats right at the Phillies on deck circle, uh, second row, box seats. I mean, because the Cubs blow at this time. It's, you know, it's September 27, 1983. The Cubs are horrendous. So there's, the place is going to be empty, so I, I wind up scoring these amazing seats. Uh, so I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to see batting practice, and I'm going to wait for Mike Schmidt. So I'm there. And uh, I'm right, I get into the stadium, and I'm right by the dugout. And the, it's, it's amazing to be that close, especially in Wrigley because it's so small. So uh, uh, everybody's there, and they're milling about, and they're doing their batting practice. And the Phillies are out for batting practice, and uh, they're being very nice. And uh, <clears throat> Mike Schmidt comes out of the dugout. And as I'm standing there, I'm with Eddie, who, you know, he's got a buzz cut and a flask. I mean, that's, maybe, that's why, maybe that's why I'm not meeting Mike Schmidt, because you can see that I'm with, uh, you know, Johnny Two Strikes. And... Uh, uh, so I'm waiting for Mike Schmidt, and in addition to me waiting for Mike Schmidt, there's like a nine-year-old kid who has a homemade, handmade sign that says, Happy Birthday, Mike Schmidt, and it's got like pictures of him playing baseball and his baseball card, and he's standing on a chair waiting for Mike Schmidt to come out, and it's his birthday. Again, I'm and I have his name, and I'm, I, so I, I went up talking to the parents of the kid, and uh, and they're just like, shut up, dirtbag, and your flannel. Nobody wants to talk to you at, at all. We're, our son is here to meet Mike Schmidt. So the Phillies are there, and then Mike Schmidt comes out of the dugout, and he looks right at us, sees the kid with the sign, and he just goes, how you doing? And turns around and walks off. Doesn't come over, doesn't sign anything, doesn't say, oh, look at the young man with a nice sign. And the, even the kid says, Mike, Mike, like, like literally out of a Coke commercial where Joe Green throws him his jersey. Mike, Mike, holding the sign. Mike Schmidt turns on a fucking heel and goes right to take batting practice. Takes batting practice, goes right back into the dugout. Done. Adios. Mike Schmidt doesn't even make eye contact with anybody. He wants nothing to do 
with anyone. And you know what? If you know anything about him, when you read about him, he was a real uptight, like all business type of ball player. So maybe they were going to clinch the division, and that's why he was like that. Who fucking knows? All I know is there's an eight-year-old kid with a sign with your name on it saying "Happy Birthday." Stop and say thanks. That's all you got to do. Even even if you can ignore me and my giant head, I don't care. <laughs> At the time, I care. At the age of 16, I'm sure I freak out. But now when I look back at it, I'm like, well, you know, there's a, I, that, to me, the biggest transgression is to avoid that little kid. I don't understand why you do that. So uh, I'm upset. I'm not happy that Mike Schmidt hasn't stopped to talk to me. So uh, <laughs> I also was kind of a heckler as a kid. No. Like uh, when we would go to baseball games and stuff. Like, here, what, All right, one time we went to Comiskey Park. And uh, there was a guy named Daryl Porter, who was a player for the Kansas City Royals, and uh, he went through drug rehab. And this is at a time when that was rare. Uh, so he was there, and uh, we threw aspirin at him, like the entire game. <laughs> like, just after he came back from rehab, like we threw aspirin. Uh, it, was, it wasn't nice. Uh, but that's, you know, again, when you're a kid, you think that's hysterical. One day, we were seeing the Orioles play the White Sox. And I'm really loud. Like, that's another thing is my voice is crazy loud, and it carries. So we happened to be uh, in – we didn't have great seats in Comiskey, but then we snuck down because there was a rain delay and everybody left, so we were really close to the field. And for some reason, I decided that Joe Nolan was a jagoff. <laughs> Joe Nolan was a player on the Orioles. He's like a backup catcher. He never played, but he's in the game, and I'm – dominating joe nolan i mean i am just like hey i hope you enjoy your at bat this week nolan you punk i'm just like and not swearing but just yelling the worst like you know hey nolan you know you, you why are you in the majors and my friends are dying we're dying we think it's hysterical even the usher comes to tell us like to be quiet but he's laughing like he can't stop laughing because i'm loud like i mean you could hear it because there's nobody in the park there might be like you know four thousand people in the park and but that, that was what I would do is I would pick a guy that nobody would ever hassle. Like, why would you ever hassle Joe Nolan? It makes no sense, but that was my target. And I just buried Joe Nolan one day at Comiskey. Uh, I did it in Chicago Stadium one time. Uh, it was my little brother. My little brother Andy had it in him, too. We went to the Bulls in Utah, and my little brother just decided Larry Kristoviak needed to be taken down a peg. Kristoviak's a white guy on the bench. He's doing nothing to anybody. And my brother Andy's just like, Kristoviak's a bum! Kristoviak, you are a slob. I mean, just letting him have it to the point where you can see their bench laughing because they're like, who is yelling at Larry Kristoviak? <laughs> That's the best part is to take off and just really hammer a guy who, you know, who deserve, doesn't deserve it at all. So uh, I've, I've let Nolan have it and I've got Porter in my back pocket. So we're at Chicago. Uh, we're at Wrigley Field. Cubs come out to take batting practice. And Jody Davis puts on a show. Jody Davis is hitting bombs, just really just crushing the ball. And uh, the Cubs are out there taking batting practice. Larry Boa is out there. He's at the cage. So Ron Say comes out to take batting practice. Ron Say, uh, third baseman, known as the Penguin, famous with the Dodgers, played with the Cubs. He comes out to play, uh, to take batting practice. And uh, I just start letting Say have it because I'm, I'm like frustrated that Mike Schmidt didn't come out. But also, the park is empty. And I can be, I'm loud anyway, but I'm, now I'm like right on the field. I'm really close. So I'm hammering Ron Say. I'm just like, hey, Ron Say. Hey, you know, I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm glad the Phillies are here because there's a real third baseman in town. Huh, Ron Say? Yeah, we finally got an all-star at the position. You know what? You've been over there, you know, mucking it up forever. Blah, blah. I can't remember what I said, but it was bad. I mean, I was just all over Say. Again, not swearing. That was my whole deal. Was Because then if they ever came and yelled at me, I'd go, well, I'm not being vulgar or anything. I'm just being, a, you know, a jerk. Because, uh, like, like, that was any sort of argument. So Ron Say is taking batting practice, and they're all, you know, the Cubs are out there, and I'm I'm loud to the point where they're looking at me. They're just like, what is, why is this happening? Like, who is this kid who's decided to launch on Ron Say? So Ron Say is in the cage, and uh, and he's taking a couple of swings. Finally, he takes a swing, and he puts his hand up to the pitcher, and I'm yelling. I'm letting him have it. He puts his hand up. He walks out of the batting cage, and he points the bat at me, and he goes, you think you could do any better? And I and I freeze. I I completely freeze, because, again, I you know I'm I'm mouthy and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not ready for a for a discussion with Ron Say. <laughs> this is a one-sided conversation with with me and the the idea of Ron Say. This is a two-dimensional Ron Say accepting my abuse and going, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. It's my job to listen to you when you yell at me. It's not a discussion. It's not my dinner with Say. It's not my dinner with the penguin. 
So he walks out of the batting cage and he points the bat at me and he goes, you think you could do any better? And I freeze. Like, I don't know what to do or say. My mouth is open. And again, I'm a fat kid with a bunch of hair. I mean, I, 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 he could have destroyed me if he wanted. But just, just that sentence enough was enough to put me completely on my heels. And I, I just, uh, uh, and he goes, do you? You think you could do any better? And I, I can't even process it. And he goes, yeah, I didn't think so. Shut up. Turns around, gets back in the batting cage. Larry Boa dying. Absolute Larry Boa laughing his ass off because say calls out this fat kid. I mean, just let him. I mean, literally walked over to me, points the bat at me, and lets me have it. Yeah, I didn't think so. Shut up. Shut up. Ron Say told me to shut up. And I'm, I'm like. I'm frozen. I don't know what to do. And all the, you know, Cub fans that are around me, there's barely any, but there's enough. And they're just like, Maha! they're hammering me now. They're like, way to go, tough guy. Way to really back up your position. That was your chance. I mean, I don't know. If, what if I had said yes? Like, would he have let me take a few swings? I mean, I don't know what was going to happen. But Say tells me to shut up. That's what he does. Brutal. Just hammers me. So I'm, I slump down. I'm just like, oh, I'm completely defeated. No Mike Schmidt. Called out by Ron Say. This day could not get any worse. At least the Phillies are going to win and clinch the division. That'll be great. I'm here for it. It's good because the Cubs blow. They're, and and also, uh, Rick Russell is pitching. Who's just like this, Rick Russell had some great years later in his career. But when he was at the Cubs, he was just kind of a guy who got the job done. So I'm like, the, and Steve Carlton was pitching. So I'm like, Steve Carlton's going to dominate the Cubs. It's going to be fantastic. But again, I can't shake the fact that Say blasted me. I'm like, what's going to happen here? Second inning. Off Steve Carlton, Keith Moreland singles, Keith Moreland's on base. Ron Say comes up and hits a two-run home run. Goes And all of the people around my section are pointing at me and yelling at me. They are just like, dude, and they're just like, fr-. and Ron Say, I swear to God, he, he does the trot, his weird penguin trot, comes around third base, steps on home plate, claps twice, points at me. And turns to go into the dugout. Ron Say hits a two-run homer off Steve Carlton, best left-handed pitcher I'd ever seen in my life. And then I'm like, well, that's okay. The Cubs are going to hammer Rick Rushell. Rick Rushell gets hurt. The Cubs bring in Steve Trout, the previously aforementioned Steve Trout, who I just made fun of as a bum left-hander. I think he throws five shutout innings, and the Cubs win 3 nothing. Oh. Phillies don't even score. Mike Schmidt strikes out like three times. I'm sitting there I just <laughs> frozen. Like, I don't even know what to do. I, I, it was like the big thing that Phillies are going to clinch. I'm going to meet Mike Schmidt. Nothing. Not only don't I meet Mike Schmidt, not only do the Phillies not win or clinch the division or clinch a tie for the division, but I am upbraided by Ron Say, who then beats the Phillies single-handedly with a two-run home run and points at me when he's finished. (laughs) And I think I I still have the videotape of him coming around, stepping on the plate, clapping twice, and pointing at me and going into the dugout. Unbelievable. That was my Cubs-Philly story. That was the story I was going to tell if the Cubs played the Phillies in the playoffs because it would have been a lot funnier and more relevant. But instead I tell it now hoping that the Phillies somehow win the World Series this year and salve the wounds that have festered for 25 years, courtesy of the Penguin Ron Say. Come on, that story should have gotten a lot more, right? Right? (laughs) Although I know you can't hear me because already you've furiously sat down and started typing to sell me how fucking great it was. You don't have to sell me that. You can tell me that if you'd like. I mixed up my S's and my T's. That happens a lot. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's really hard when I order soup. All right. Uh, I love the word soup. So, folks, here we are in the midst of the clip show with, with actual new content inside of the, inside of the womb of the older content. Um, uh, so, yeah, I jerked off to that story last night at my house. It was good. <laughs> um, so, you know me, and you know I have this weird thing about uh, I talk till I'm done. Um, but I also have this thing in my head where I've kind of established a baseline of how long shows should be. 
And Lily and I have this discussion every week where I'm just like, well, fuck, I go, I go, that's a perfect ending, but it's only like an hour and 20 minutes. And she's like, so what? You're done, right? That's perfect ending, right? You're done. And I go, yeah, but people kind of expect more. And she's like, you're wrong. People want you to be funny. And they don't, if you put out a 15 minute show and it was funny, people would be happy with that. And I shook my head furiously and I went, you are absolutely wrong because my email runs contrary to that, as a matter of fact. Um, and I, let me tell you this. I thought of this, by the way, and I'll, I'll throw this out to you guys and see what your voting is like. Uh, uh, by the way, I should mention, I have not told Lily this yet. So she's going to be hearing about this for the first time as long, along with you guys. Um, well, you know, I do the show on Wednesday and it's, it can be two hours. You know what I mean? And I'll come here and we hang out. What if I did a half hour show every day? <laughs> That's hysterical. Like, like Monday through Friday. And I put it out like a, cause I mean, is that too much like terrestrial radio then? I mean, is that cause I, cause I wondered if it was like, it is kind of like a job, yeah. I guess we'd, yeah, we'd need to, we'd need to do something more for that. Yeah, I know you do, but but then I maybe I could do them part. Well, I don't want to do it myself, like on Audacity or whatever. I don't even know what that changes. Like I, I just, I'm trying to, I always try to think of fresh ways to to do the show and be different. Like having you on microphone a few weeks ago was awesome to me because it was like it was different. Um, and, and it's funny, I even thought about, you know, because I knew we were going to be, we had to do these shows kind of ahead of time. So I was like, what if I brought somebody in? Or what if I did this? And then I was like, no, nah, that's not what I do, man. The, the, the show, stay true to the show and what this is and what it's me talking and you here and all of that stuff. Um, but then I was wondering, what if I did like short shows every day instead of like one long show a week? But then people are like, no, dude, we totally love the fact that you do long shows. So then that's what gets me and it makes me want to do long shows. And then we get to navel gazing like this bullshit, which is where I'm doing talking in circles about nothing that nobody cares about. All right, so. Uh, because I care sometimes about how long the show is. And again, this is probably stupid to even do this, but I'm doing it because what the fuck? I want to. Uh, as I was going through the clips last night and I was going through the liner notes and trying to find stuff to play, uh, I went through the liner notes of year one and I found the liner notes of this particular episode and it said, this fucking episode is hilarious. I don't know how people didn't notice it. It got mixed up and it got lost in the shuffle of this and this and this, but it's great. And so in my head I went, it must be great. So I'm putting the whole episode in here. Because I didn't feel like going through and hearing the great parts. I said, you know what? If I, if I said in the liner notes this was a great episode, then fuck, I trust past me. Past me doesn't lie. So, uh, hey, folks, my teeth are strong. I'm not making any money talking these days. Good Christ, 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 Christ. <laughs> Dick, folks. I'm not gonna lie to you. Still am. I guess I am a decent guy because I'm a, a, I'm a fucking jerk, uh, and I'm not a jerk. Apparently, I'm a dick. I'm not an awful guy, but I've just I've done so much ridiculous stuff. Man, I am. Uh, man, I'm an awful guy. Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt, forty-year-old boy podcast? It is Wednesday. Uh, normally we record on Tuesday, but Lily had a thousand. She's so busy. And uh, I, of course, had a very important fantasy football draft. I was at this fantasy football draft yesterday, and a guy's on the phone. He's talking to, like, a client or his work or I don't know who. And uh, at the, he goes, you know what? I'm actually I'm at a fantasy football draft, so I'm going to have to call you back. Is there a worst excuse? Is there a worse excuse for getting off the phone than I'm at a fantasy football draft? You might as well just say, hey, I'm a gay nerd, and I can't possibly speak to you any longer. I couldn't believe, I can't even imagine what the person on the other end of the phone is thinking at that point. Oh, oh, you uh, would like to talk to me a little longer, but unfortunately you have to go jerk off in a room full of dickwads picking fake football players. Fantastic. Well, I can see where I rank on your priority scale. By all means, let me go. And do me a favor, if you could, have somebody draft this phone number from you so you don't have it anymore so you can never call me back. Because God forbid I ever attempt to speak to you again when you blow me off for something other. What, you have, oh, you have a discussion with your imaginary friend from childhood? Well, of course, I'll call you back. I, there is no worse excuse for getting off the phone. I'm at a fantasy football draft. Let me give you a call back. The only thing worse would have been like if it was his wife or his kid or somebody like that. If you, then if you drop that, then you could just you could actually put her on speaker and and hear her eyes roll in her head. Uh, and I don't know what that sounds like, but I know what this sounds like. That's my teeth. Uh, I was doing that beforehand because I put the you have to put the microphone on and do like a little sound check. Uh, uh, my roadies come in, they strum my guitars, they hit my drum. And I bring, bring, bring. 
apparently I have all of these instruments here, and they all sound just like that. How horrible is that? Bring, bring, bring. That's the worst guitar ever. Would you ever pay to hear that guitar? I don't think you would. Uh, but in the soundtrack, I, I did a cheat. I, I chattered my teeth. I, I, I almost said a cheat tattering. I did a teeth chattering. And uh, Lily was uh, stunned by how loud my teeth are. Because they're loud, friends. That's my teeth. All right, they're strong. I, uh, I may have just chipped some enamel off my teeth. I'm not going to lie to you folks. So it is good to be here. Uh, and uh, by the way, there you go. That's Remember I said in a previous episode, if I ever say it is good to be here, that means I have nothing to talk about or nothing to say. I said, if you see me on stage, that is a, that is a things have gone uh, terribly wrong. Uh, that's, a, that's a verbal placeholder. Mark it down, folks. It's a drinking game. Whenever I say it's good to be here, knock a shot back. You will be loaded in 18 minutes this week because it is good to be here. Uh, I don't know what to do with myself, folks. My wife is gone. My wife is still gone. And not gone in the way you think she's gone. I, I know if you listen to this show, you're probably waiting for the show where, oh, uh, yeah, th his wife is gone. But no, she's gone for work. Like, she's been gone for two weeks. But she comes home tonight. Ha-ha. I'm very excited. And uh, it's, it's going to be one more. And you're excited, too, for some weird reason? That seems odd. People want you on mic. It's funny. People write me all the time. They're like, put Lily on mic. And they don't realize it's not me keeping Lily off mic. Lily doesn't want to be on mic. She's loud enough without a goddamn microphone. <laughs> but people always write me, you, you need to get a mic for your, uh, some guy, this is my favorite one this week, you need to get a mic for your girlfriend. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite one, and also here's my other favorite one. Hey, that guy that's laughing is kind of annoying because I know when to laugh, I don't need to be told when to laugh. So some people think you're a dude, and some people think we're dating. So I mean, it's, uh, it's a coin flip at this point, God knows. Uh, your girl, put your girlfriend on mic. Give your girlfriend a microphone. P I was like, P.S. too. Who writes P.S. ever in these day and age? What are you, seven? P.S. Give your girlfriend a microphone. Uh, what does P.S. even mean? Postscript, right? Yeah, it means postscript. She's nodding. Uh, you don't, her, her nodding is not as loud as my teeth. Can't get over my teeth, folks. I do that and Karen hates it. Karen hates it so much. We'll be in the car and I'll just be the... She's like, what are you doing? Stop. Uh, it's because I have uh, uh, that's I have ADD uh, of the jaw. Uh, <laughs> I do. I have a specific uh, attention deficit disorder in my mouth. That's it. Uh, you know, it's like I'll be chewing one thing and then I go, I got to chew something else immediately. My teeth are very impatient. Uh, wow. All right. <laughs> this is a lot of nothing. So uh, yeah. So that, that's uh, Lily and I. I went to I went to Lily's burlesque show Sunday, and uh, I went with David. Uh, her husband, and uh, we showed up. And before we left, because again, Karen's gone, man, and I got nothing to do. I, I lit And I wish I, it, it seemed like in theory I would have a great time. Like I'm like, oh, cool, Karen's going on two weeks, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I did nothing. I sat around ruining the day my wife left. That's it. Because she's my best friend, and she's the person I do everything with. You know, we go to the movies, we go out, we do this. Even if I'm home just watching TV, it's with her or whatever. And uh, and I, I'm uh, I'm not good alone. I I, I I mean, I'm good alone. I mean, it's not like, you know, anything horrible happens. But, uh, you know, to do things, I need a, uh, I need somebody to ride shotgun with. I need a wingman. I need a, I need a wife. I need a wife, folks. <laughs> and uh, mine is gone. But she's back. She's back tonight. I'm picking her up at the airport and then uh, having sex with her in a parking garage close by. Uh we did that one time. We did that. At, there was a there's a hotel right there, and there's a parking garage. We went to the top of the parking garage because you can see the planes landing and coming in, and uh, and uh, did some damage up there in the in view of the planes. It was fun. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen tonight. That's my guess. I'm guessing it won't. Although I will probably you know just for old time's sake pull into that parking garage and then have her go go home. <laughs> she hasn't been home in two weeks. The last thing she wants to do is get off a six hour flight from Philadelphia and get worked in a parking lot. Uh, but me, I don't, you know, I'm just sitting here. It, literally, it's like my dick is at the starting line. I mean, I'm just like, all right, waiting for the gun to go off. So the gun can go off. Uh, but I'm picking her up tonight. So I'm excited about that. And uh, I was talking to her and she forgot she was on East Coast time. And she's like, you should get to the airport at 630. I said, I thought your flight was in at 930. And she's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm at 930. I'm like, I'll get there at 630. I don't care. Put up one of those signs and just hold it. It says, you know, uh, Mike's wife. See if anybody else responds to that. What if anybody did? That'd be great. Some other chick is just like, hi, I'm Mike's wife. Well, then let's go to a parking lot. Because I'm going to show you the planes landing. If you can keep your eyes open long enough. All right. So 
<sighs> so I went to the burlesque show Sunday night. I went to that extravaganza. And uh, by went to the burlesque show, I mean I went there. Doesn't necessarily mean I got in, and here's why. Before we left, I called David, and I said, hey, where is this thing tonight? And he said, it's at the Bordello. Some, uh, I go, well, is it like, is there a dress code? Is, there, is it fancy schmancy or whatever? Because I go to Lily's show on Monday nights, and there's no dress code. It's like, you know, it's summer, so people wear what they wear. And uh, it's dark. It's a dark club. And uh, nobody cares. And uh, the women are naked anyway. Who fucking cares what I wear? Nobody's looking at me. I could walk in in a fucking chicken costume. Everybody's like, hey, look at that chick. Nobody cares. Uh, although I guess if I'm wearing a chicken costume and say, hey, look at that chick, they could be talking about me. So... <laughs> But so I, I said to David, I go, what is it? He goes, well, I know, typical nightclub. And I go, well, you know what? I'll put on some jeans because I was wearing uh, uh, board shorts, like three-quarter board shorts. I go, well, I'll throw on a pair of long pants. And uh, then I was working at the house and I was doing some stuff. And by working, I mean I was doing nothing. And then it came time to go pick up David. And then I split. I went and picked him up. And we get there. And uh, uh, we're driving. We're going all over. And uh, it dawns on me, I didn't put on any long pants. <laughs> I'm wearing the three-quarter board shorts. But I'm like, ah, oh, who cares? It's just, you know, I'm sure it won't be a problem. And uh, we get down to downtown Los Angeles, and we park, and we walk to the door, and the bouncer stops me and goes, I don't suppose you have any pants in the car, do you? Which is, he's being nice. I understand what he's doing. It's ludicrous. Nobody has pants in their car, I don't think. Who, who often thinks, I mean, you know, that's someone who's prone to accidents, I would think, if you're like, I always carry a spare pair of pants. I've always got spare slacks somewhere in my car. That's how I like to do it. Just in case something crazy happens, I like to have another pair of trousers to slip into. I don't. Uh, so I, I go, unfortunately, no. And uh, he goes, you know, and he actually, this is funny, he, he actually looks over my shoulder. Like like one of those things where you look around, like if you're telling somebody a secret, like, Psst, hey, buddy, and you look around. Well, he actually did that. He like looked over my shoulder and looked around. And he goes, well, the owner doesn't really like people wearing shorts. And he was about to say, but I'll let you in anyway. But if he comes, he's probably going to ask you to leave. But he didn't get any of that out because the five-year-old in the board shorts went, fine, I'll leave. That was me. Uh, but not in a, like, I wasn't that pissy about it because I wasn't mad at him. It wasn't anything to do with him. It was me. I was mad at me because I had asked the question before I left my house. Should I put on some long pants like a big boy? Yes, you should put on big pants like a leg, like a big pants like a leg boy. Long pants like a big boy. And uh, <laughs> and I didn't change and I, I knew it. It was like the whole time I was dreading going there. I'm like, it's, what if this is the one place that won't allow shorts at the at the fucking strip club show? And uh, sure oh, enough. Yeah. It should be. It would have been. They probably would have let me wear shorts. Ah. The, the illusion of class brought by burlesque <laughs> was what led to me having to wear long pants. Uh, so uh, this guy, and he was very friendly and very nice about it, but I was, of course, up my own ass, and I just go, no, that's fine. Look, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I'll take off. He's like, are you sure? Because, I mean, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, the owners, it's their policy. It's not ours, really. And I go, that's okay. I'll split. I'll split. And David is sitting there slack-jawed because he knows the guy was going to give us a break and let us in. But, of course, I turned into a child, and I immediately stomped my feet. I'm like, no, I don't want to go in if I can't go in meh, without getting talked to because I'm a fucking baby. Uh, and then we walked halfway down the block, and I looked at David, and I go, hey, man, I'm really sorry. And he goes, that's okay, but, uh, you know, I just didn't want to get in, you know, you when you get in that mode, like, I don't even want to talk to you. And I go, I understand, and I'm so sorry about that. He goes, you know, he probably would have let us in. I go, yeah, in retrospect, I think that probably would have happened. I think he would have probably let us in. But, uh, you know, when I think about it, uh, <sighs> do I really want to go into a place like that? And uh, But, yeah, I do. I, I wanted to, and I should have gone, and I, uh, but I didn't. So that was my Sunday. Uh, because I'm lost, not my wife. My wife would have been there. She would have just fucking snapped her fingers out and said, okay, sorry. Uh, but uh, she wasn't there to keep me in control, so I, I was able to fly off the handle and be an idiot. But, uh, uh, and, and so I looked at David. I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry. And you know, he's like, that's cool. And it's just something I got to work on. And I know I got to work on that, whatever. But uh, it would have stopped there. <laughs> it would have stopped there with me being an idiot and uh, apologies all around. And then David and I would have gotten the car and then gone home. Uh, until David's phone rang and it was Lily. And uh, Lily's in the, you know, plays with her feathers on and her ridiculous rhinestones and her, you know, puppy dolls and whatever else she's got to do for her act. And she calls him. She's like, where are you guys? And David's like, uh, you know what? Mike is wearing shorts and they wouldn't let him in the door. And David is on a cell phone 
on a Bluetooth, and I still heard, what? <laughs> Burst. I, I don't know if it went from one, his, his Bluetooth ear out his other ear, <laughs> but this shriek of, what? And David's like, don't worry, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. And I hear Lily go, that's fucking bullshit. That's unbelievable. I can't believe it. And she's, she's screaming, and I can hear her through his Bluetooth. And, uh, and he hangs up the phone, and he goes, yeah, uh, I think she's losing it right now, probably. <laughs> I go, why? The guy was nice. And he goes, doesn't matter. She's decided that uh, this is wrong, and she's going to, I guess, fight for you. And I go, she doesn't have to. I don't mind. It's my fault. She's, he's like, yeah, there's really no telling her that at this point because she's just as insane as you are. And I'm like, okay, well, so what's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. As we're talking, Lily screeches up in her car, hits the brakes. This is fucking bullshit. I'm out of here. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I told them I'm not dancing in there. If they were not going to let you in, I can't believe it. And then, unbelievably, other things have happened that I can't talk about right now because if I say them, then someone's going to know about them and then it's going to be a problem. But Lily had other problems. Let's put it this way. There were much larger problems for Lily, but she decided to make my shorts the focal point of why she walked out the door. The straw. It was the fuse. It was the straw. It was the straw that uh, broke the... The camel's back. Okay, good. Uh, if, if I can use that cliche on my podcast. But uh, Lily was furious about nine other things, and then they wouldn't let me in with the shorts, and that was... So, but, but that's the problem, though. She then went to the bouncer and blew dry the bouncer in front of everybody. What do you mean you can't let him in? I can't believe it. There's no dress code here. Ah, ah, ah. Even though he was really nice to me, uh, but Lily freaked out on him and then piled into her car. And let me tell you something. There is nothing funnier than a burlesque dancer angry who's in full costume. She screeches up in her car... And she leans out the window, and she's furious. And I just want to laugh in her face because she looks like Dee Snyder. Just her fucking hair is teased out the fucking window, and she's got makeup on makeup on makeup. She's got just like a rainbow face. She she just, oh, my God. It, it looks like she had like literally the rainbow eye. It looks like a leprechaun shit on her head. I mean, it's like this rainbow I mean, just piles and piles of makeup and hair and feathers and poodles. And and she's yelling out the window. And I'm just like, well, apparently uh, there's only one thing I can say right here. We're not going to take it. <laughs> no, we ain't going to take it. Because Dee Snyder is furious about my shorts. <laughs> it was crazy. So I felt bad enough. But now I feel horrible that she's cut these ties in the burlesque world. But then I have to admit I was cheered up by the fact that, uh, you know, she's Clara belled out and screaming out the window. I mean, it's just like, it was like having a fight with a clown, literally. Like, like if you were to go to the circus and, have a, and step on a clown's foot on accident. And by, and by the way, that happens all the time because they've got like size 48 feet. So when you walk into the arena, you're stepping on a clown foot. And uh, you remember Stepping on a Clown Foot? That was a Van Morrison album in 1979. And, uh, oh, Stepping on a Clown Foot, one of my favorites. But uh, but yeah, it's, it was like going jaw to jaw with a with a clown, where she's just screaming out the window and furious, and she's so angry, and it's just it's just hard to take her seriously, because you know it, it looks like Ace Freely is yelling at me. Uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm responsible for her uh, uh, cutting ties with the burlesque world on Sunday, and uh, all because I didn't put on big boy pants. Because I'm a fucking idiot. Because I And I knew it. And I left my house. I, change your pants. Put on big boy pants. You're going to a nightclub. And this is coming from the guy who hates people who wear sandals. And I, you know what? I'll bet you, though, I'll bet you there are people with sandals in that club. And, and that, that, to me, is the worst. If you're a man, put on some goddamn socks. Cover your feet. You're a grown man. Unbelievable. I hate it. I can't stand it. I don't understand the sandals. I saw a guy at a restaurant the other day. This is disgusting. He had sandals on. And he, he was sitting at the table, and he kicked them off and, like, tucked his feet up under his chair like a lady would. I wanted to, I was just going to slam his head in his soup. I was so fucking disgusted by him. I was like, dude, come on. This is, it's bad enough you're wearing sandals. There's still that thin layer of Birkenstock protection from uh, you and society. But when you kick them off, then, uh, you know, you're just going straight up Woodstock on everybody, and that's not cool, dude. You know, it's, it's 2008. Hippies are out. Out! Don't be a hippie, a filthy hippie. Put your shoes on. Put on some shoes. <laughs> I miss my wife. <laughs> She's gone. She's calling me from Philadelphia and all these different places, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm doing nothing. Just 
still taping your Oprahs. Still making sure uh, all that's there for you when you come home. Can we watch all the Mad Men's when you come home? I'm lost. All right, so. Although, <laughs> you know what? We had a, we had an incident before she left. Uh, before I, I went to watch the UFC over at my buddy Paul Gil Martin's house. And then uh, I came back to uh, my house, and she was in bed, so I came in to, like, uh, tuck her in. And I came in to say goodnight. And I, I put my, uh, I, I, like, well, I went to give her a kiss. She was in bed, so I laid down. And uh, I put my hand in her face, and I kissed her, and she looks at me. She wheels her hand, her head real fast. She goes, where were you? I said, I went to Paul's. I went to watch the fight. You know I went to watch the fight. She goes, what were you doing, really? And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I went to, I went to Paul's. And she kind of starts laughing, and I go, what? And she goes, what's with, what's, what's on your hands? I go, what are you talking about? She goes, and she got real quiet. It's funny, we're the only people in the room, but she said it quietly, like, I, I don't know if she's going to offend somebody. She goes, you have stripper pussy hands. <laughs> I go, what are you talking about? She goes, your hands. She goes, they smell like a, like a stripper. And I'm like, what are you? You're insane. I was at Paul's at the fight. I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, well, smell your hands. So I smell my hands, and they smelled like candy because... Paul and I were eating red licorice, like red licorice out in the tub, and she said that it smelled like strippers, because if you ever go to a strip club, because Karen and I went to, a, we've gone to a strip club before, and the strippers smell, that's what strippers smell like, they smell like candy, they do it on purpose, uh, they have some sort of like body spray, and that's the funny part is I brought Karen to a strip club, and she's like, you know, uh, you know, Karen's, she was like, oh, all right, maybe I'll go, so she went. And uh, you, it's funny, you go into a strip club with a chick, and uh, and then all the strippers immediately come over, which is great. But even better, uh, it's great in theory, except all they want to do is talk to the chick. Like, they want nothing to do with you, which is, I guess, fine, because, I mean, I don't really, you know, the last thing I want to do is be juggling strippers in front of my wife. Uh, but the strippers come over, and they're like, hey, hi, how are you? And I'm like, hey, it's my wife's first time. Well, that's all they need to hear, because then immediately, like, there's just, like, this stripper dog pile on top of my wife. And she's just looking at me like, ah, oh, Michael, uh. and uh, and she then she you know they're all friendly and nice, and then they go off and they do whatever they're gonna do, and uh, and then Karen's like, they smell like candy, and I'm like, yeah, that's like their thing. So then whenever the strippers would come over, it'd be like, hey, you want to dance? And Karen'd be like, what is that? What what do you smell like? What is that spray? And it's some stuff you can get at the hustler store, like uh, it's like a body spray, but it it smells like cake or something. I don't know what the hell it was called. Uh, but then we had to go, of course, then, uh, uh, Karen's like, well, let's go get that stuff from the stripper, from the, from the Hustler club. Cause I like it. And, uh, so that, but then I, we're still at the strip club. Karen goes into the restroom and then she comes out with this weird face, like, just like, you know, cause Karen, she's been around and stuff. She knows what's going on, but still, if she sees something weird, she's just like, what the hell? So she comes out and she's like, all right, you got to watch these next two girls that come out of the bathroom. I'm like, what's going on? And she's like. And then these two strippers come out. She goes, they were in there making out. Just like these two strippers are in there making out. And they had a vodka bottle they had hidden in the ceiling. They had reached up and gotten vodka out of the ceiling and offered Karen a cap, like a shot. And Karen did a shot of vodka with these two strippers. And then the two strippers started making out. And she said that the vibe was there. Like if Karen wanted to, she could kind of jump in if she wanted. And Karen's just like, yeah, I'm going to wash my hands and take off. Thanks for the vodka. And she's just like, this is the weirdest place. And I'm like, yes, it is. Because I had told her, too, before we went in the strip club, I go, look, nobody touches anybody here. I go, that's the deal. It's like, hands off, uh, you know, the second, you know, you have to basically, guys sit there and the stripper does whatever they want. And if a guy moves an arm, a giant Latino guy will come over and punch him in the head. Like, it's like, you don't even move. And, uh, and that would, that, you know, so that's fine. And then the strippers come over and they're grabbing my wife and they're jumping on her and they're doing like they're, you know, they're very handsy with my wife. My wife's just like, ah, I thought there was no, no touching. Wasn't there no touching in this place? And, uh, and I'm just sitting there going, yeah, I didn't think there was. This seems crazy. <laughs> but they loved her and to the point they loved my wife so much. There were other women there, like other girls, like who obviously were there for that reason. 
and they were upset that like my wife was getting all the attention from the strippers because we I'm not kidding you we had three strippers at our table who were like talking to Karen and like stroking her hair and like they're like like hitting on her like in a weird like hey let's go out sometime like are you seem pretty nice my name's you know Phyllis like they're not even they even dropped all pretense of cinnamon and rodeo at that point now they're like giving their real name to my wife and uh, and they're having a like night like chat and Karen and uh, Karen is so cute because she works for uh, uh, you know a hair care company she works in the corporate office and then they have hair shows so Karen is like hey do you want to be a hair model like I told you she asked the people at the Greek theater that she asked the strippers that and I got to be honest I wasn't on board with the Greek theater people but I am all for the strippers coming to the hair show let's get them involved let's hide some vodka in the ceiling of the hair show and let's do it. That sounds fantastic. Uh, so then I got my wife a dance. Like I was gonna get my wife a dance, and Karen's just like, "Don't, you know, don't do that." But I don't, I didn't care. And uh, I was paying for a uh, a lab dance for Karen, and Karen's just like, "What are you doing?" I said, "Come on, it'll be fun," or whatever. And uh, and it was so funny because Karen, you know, I, not back in the in the crazy champagne room, but just in a you know just in a regular side booth, <laughs> wherever I guess where everybody could see. But uh, but I and so I could see basically that was what I wanted because I could you you can't whatever I couldn't go back in the champagne room uh, you can't do couples back there I asked anyway uh, so I get this and Karen this stripper like takes Karen you know by the hand and she's all excited and Karen's just like ulp like you ever seen a cartoon or in a, in a comic book when someone's like going ulp and they're like swallowing hard that's what Karen's doing and Karen sits down and this woman starts doing the crazy uh, lap dance stuff uh, on Karen. And uh, she, again, pretty handsy. And, uh, and 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 the best part of it is like, you know, I see all I see is Karen's legs and the strippers between them, and she's grinding on Karen, and that's all I can see. And then when she would shimmy down enough, you would, I would see Karen's face, and she was just like, oh, uh, uh, Michael. It, it was like, you know what? I think it was probably like what happens when parents have to give their kid their first haircut at a barber shop. <laughs> And you have to turn the kid loose and trust the salon person. And you see your baby there sitting in the chair and, and they're getting their hair cut or they're getting, you know, ground upon by a stripper. And, uh, and they're making that face that says, I trusted you. Man, I trusted you. What are you doing? And then they start to cry. Uh, but Karen didn't cry. She lived through it. But it was so great because it was like it was like Karen was on a carnival ride. Like it would just be like stripper, 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 shimmy, shimmy, shimmy. Ah, Karen's face just like, oh my God, what's happening? And uh, and I loved it, man. I thought it was hysterical. I loved every second of it. And and Karen's just kind of like, uh, and eventually uh, she was sitting in a red velvet booth. And eventually I couldn't see her face because she turned so red, she just blended in with the booth. All I saw were glasses and black hair. That was it. And uh, and the stripper's doing her thing. And the stripper then like leans in hard on Karen and she's got her arms around her neck. And then, and then Karen, then Karen's just like, then Karen's like actively looking for me to make sure that I haven't left. And I'm like, I'm here. Don't worry. Everything's fine. Again, it's just like the kid getting the haircut. The kid's probably looking for his mommy. He's like, what, what's happening? I don't. And you're like, I'm, I'm here. Everything's fine. Just relax. We all have to do it at some point. Pretty soon you'll get used to it. And this is something you'll do on your own and you'll enjoy it. Yeah, Karen just sat there, and uh, and Karen was very nice. He was very, and it was funny. Then at the end, like you know, the stripper finished, and I come over, and I'm like, "How was it?" And, and the stripper's like, uh, "It was great." You know, she was all for it. And Karen just goes, "Thank you." <laughs> like like Karen, like she was in a, you know, like she'd been helped by a waiter or something. She's just like, "Thank you, I appreciate that. That was nice." And Karen got up and like kind of, and then she kind of wobbled away. You know, she's just kind of staggering and looking at me like, "What just happened?" I don't. You know, she had like, a, you know, newborn cult legs, you know what I mean, where she's just kind of wobbling back to the booth. And there's the other three strippers waiting for her. And Karen's just like, this is kind of overwhelming. <laughs> 900 women all grabbing my wife going, hey, like, you know what? We could get a, a lap dance for you. What if you did all of us at once? And I'm going, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Karen just kind of sitting there going, I don't, yeah, this is okay. I'm, I, uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Uh, but that's why it was so funny when she said I had stripper pussy hands because, like, uh, you know, I mean, because I smelled like licorice. And it's just like, but her, that her mind would go to that because this, this is years ago that we went. So the fact that that was what would immediately come to her mind when my hands smelled like red licorice. Like, you just, what were you doing? But not mean, but like, but halfway goofing because she knew what, but I, she must have been kidding. But it was just so, you have stripper pussy hands. No, no, it's beautiful. 
So red, red licorice is what my wife thinks uh, uh, strippers smell like. And they do, man, they do. They smell like candy. <laughs> she's off in Philadelphia, and I'm telling her, I'm like, well, you should go out. You should go out and have some fun or whatever. And she's just like, oh, I will. I'll go places. But I can imagine her fun isn't like my fun would be. I'd, be, I'd find some horrible things to do out there. Although, she, <laughs> one time, because she's flying and she's traveling and all that, uh, we, we we flew home to Chicago a couple of years ago. This was funny. And uh, my wife, for some reason, was going to bring uh, a vibrator home with her, okay? And uh, she had a rabbit vibrator. And uh, if you know what the rabbit is, it's like, you know, it's, it's fucking retarded huge. I mean, it looks like a chainsaw. I mean, it's just gigantic. So, the, the, you know, this rabbit was going to travel home with us. So we actually had to fly from Las Vegas. So we we drove... We initially were going to fly from Los Angeles to Chicago, and then U.S. Air happened, and all of our flights were canceled, and uh, there was 100 people in an airport, it just, and it was a zoo. It was crazy. So what we decided to do then is fly, drive to Vegas and fly from Las Vegas to Chicago. So we drove to Vegas, and, uh, and my wife was going to bring the rabbit, but I think what she decided to do, what she, I think she remembered the movie Fight Club. Remember in Fight Club when the guy was telling the story about how uh, a vibrator will go off in luggage? And they'll think it's a bomb. So they inevitably have to pull the luggage and then pull the person off the plane and all that stuff. So my wife, to be safe, decided not to pack it. Uh, so it's like, fine. So we check our luggage in Vegas and we're walking and she looks into her bag and uh, uh, she has it in her carry-on. She's going to carry it on the plane so it doesn't alarm anybody in the, in the luggage, I guess. And then it dawns on her as we take about eight steps just before security... <laughs> She's going to have to go through the x-ray machine with the rabbit in her fucking bag. So she stops and she goes, oh. And I go, what's up? And she goes, oh, oh no. And I go, what? And she goes, all right. I'm bring I was bringing the rabbit home. And I, I, it's in the bag. And I, and I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second. You're what? She goes, well, I was bringing, I was bringing the rabbit on the trip. And, I, and I'm. Why would you bring a vibrator home for Christmas? I mean, I'm with you. What is it? Am I that? Am I that bad at it? Am I that far from doing the job that you got to bring home assistance now? Like, I mean, this was something you got for when I was on the road. I thought, unless I'm just getting replaced completely by this jackhammer in latex. And uh, and she's like, and I, I, honestly, I don't remember. I was like, why would you, it makes no sense. But the the point is we're having this argument now and there's a, it's Christmas. So there's a million people in the airport and she, she shows me her bag. She's got, and it's blue. Like we didn't get, you know, we didn't, luckily we didn't get the, cause you know why? Cause the flesh colored one was creepy to her. She was just like, nah, that's just, I don't even want that. That's crazy. It's got to look like it's from outer space. So I'm even going to be entertaining this notion. So we did, we got, it, it looked like a, uh, uh, it, it looked like a blueberry popsicle, like that crazy like light sky, not sky blue. Ah, it was dark blue, not midnight blue. Folks, I don't know. You know what? It was like, uh, it was like, I don't know. It was like a blue guy had a cock. That's what it looks like. Imagine one of the blue man group had a cock. That's what it looked like. It's that color blue. It was blue man group blue. And, uh, and it's fucking huge and it's just gigantic. And, uh, and it's in her bag and I look and I'm like, and it's like, it's not like you can miss it. And it's shaped Kind of like a gun. I mean, because the, the rabbit part is the trigger part and all that. So if it goes through security, we're getting stopped. There is no doubt we're getting stopped. And, uh, and, I don't, and I'm like, well, what are you going to do? Like, we'll go put it back in the bag. She's like, they already checked the bags. And I didn't want to put it in the bag because, uh, you know, if, if it causes a noise, like, well, you take the batteries out. All you got to do is take the batteries out. It's not a problem. So, and, and she, she's smart. She knows that. It's just we were in a hurry because we missed the flight in L.A., and then we had to go to Vegas. So it was like, it was just kind of a happenstance that, it, you know, we packed in a day and left. So I'm sure that's what it was. She just got caught up doing it that way. Just threw it in her bag and forgot about it. Because that happens a lot when you're leaving the house. You just throw your vibrator in your bag and you forget about it. It's like whenever those guys get, you know, stopped at security with a gun, a handgun, and they go, oh, man, I forgot it was in there. Really? You forgot you had a pistol in your suitcase? What are you, in the Wild West? You forgot you had a gun, idiot? Unbelievable to me. So uh, my wife goes the same route with a vibrator. Because, you know, again, that just happens. You're leaving the house, you grab your keys, you grab your cell phone, you grab your vibrator, and you split. Uh -huh. 
I understand. And again, we had a long drive. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe she wanted to make sure she paid attention during a long drive. Because uh, I've jerked off on the road trying to stay awake. I think we've all done that. When I was on the road for comedy, I, and I, any comedian who tell you that he hasn't is a liar. Because you will do it when you're driving. You're just like, this will keep me awake, probably. And you just, you know, do that for, you know, 200 miles. And it keeps your attention. Uh, so, uh, so maybe that was what her logic was. Maybe she's like, you know what, I'll go ahead and do that. So, uh, regardless, but the point is now we're eight steps away from security. And we've also, we've, we, we're approaching security in front of everybody. There's, and it's Christmas, so there's extra security there. And there's all these guards. And we're approaching the x-ray. But this is the problem. We were approaching it. We stopped and looked worried and had an animated conversation. So I got to think immediately we're on the no-fly list. Something's <laughs> happening where they're, they're looking at us and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And, they're, and I'm telling her, I'm like, well, look, we just got to go. I, I mean, there's, you know, there's nothing you can do now unless we can go back and recheck it. She's like, I'm not going through security with this in the bag because she was the one who pointed out that it would look like a gun. Like, I didn't even think about it. I'm just like, I go, well, it'll be a little embarrassing. She goes, they're going to think it's a, it's a, a gun. Uh, and so then we're talking about it and, and we're trying to stay quiet because if you say the word gun like loudly in an airport, any, any, there's all those words that if you say them loudly enough, you're going to get tackled. You know what I mean? Just, so if you say gun or, uh, or, you know, rabbit, you're going to get nailed immediately. So we're just trying to keep it quiet. And, and then I'm like, take the batteries out. You know, so I'm saying take the batteries out, which sounds like batteries and it's hooked up and there's like a, you know, a shoe bomb and I, it's just awful. So we got to figure out what, so I go, you know what, we, all right, then she's like, I'm not bringing it through security. I said, all right, well, then we got to get rid of it. <laughs> she's like, all right. And, uh, and I'm trying to think of, so I go, are there lockers here? And then, like, literally, I, those words came out of my mouth. Is there a locker here at the airport that we can lock your vibrator up in and claim it on the way home? So I actually thought if there was a locker, I'm like, well, we can go and run a locker and go ahead and put that in there. There's no locker. Because a guy would put a bomb in there, stupid. Uh, but uh, we, so we're walking and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. And uh, finally we decide we have to throw it away. That's the only thing we can do. We have to just throw it away. Uh, there's no, there, unless, I, and then part of me is a joke. I was like, well, why don't we hide it somewhere here in the airport and then see if it's here when we come back in two weeks? That would be like a fun little scavenger hunt. We could just go ahead and, uh, and, and tuck it away behind something at the coffee bean. Uh, or maybe go to the Wolfgang Puck and try to hide it behind some pizzas and uh, see if it's here when we come back. And she's just staring at me. I'm like, all right, maybe that's not the plan. So, uh, uh, and also it's the Vegas airports. So there are slot machines and stuff. So I thought, why don't we put it in the dish of a slot machine like somebody won it? So then it's like a super prize. Like somebody's like, oh, ding, ding, ding. Oh, wow. That, uh, that seems weird. But okay, I'll take it. Fantastic. Three cherries. Bang, bang. Here you go, rabbit. And uh, Karen was finally like, are you done? I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> so now we have to go, and uh, we're going to throw it away. But we don't want to just, like, because, again, it's crazy blue. Like, the second she pulls it out of her bag, it's going to be like Excalibur. Like, everyone's going to go, oh, my God. And they're going to get out of one knee and, and bow. Because it's, it's huge, and it's blue. It's crazy. It looks, like a, it looks like a phaser of some sort. It just looks like a weapon. And uh, a weapon of pleasure. And, uh, you know, so... I say, well, you know, let's go get, like, some napkins and wrap it in napkins and throw it away. Because also, it's, you know, it's not really hygienic. You don't want, I, I feel bad for that garbage man who goes over and he's like, uh, uh, it's bad enough he's sifting through garbage, but then all of a sudden he's like, oh, that's not good. Uh, but So we finally go get some napkins, and then we're rolling it up like a burrito, and it takes, like, 80 napkins, because, again, it's, it's as big as a car. It's like a car vibrator that you just start, and it drives into your vagina. I mean, it's huge. <laughs> And uh, we're wrapping it up, and it's and it's just getting bigger and crazier. So then it's like a it's the size of a football or like a calzone. It, it, it's like a cock zone. That's what it is, a cock zone. And it's huge and it's shaped like that, but it's all wrapped up. And now we're going to throw that away. And then part of me thinks Man, we got to hide even that from somebody because they're going to think we're dumping a baby in the in the the garbage can. Uh, so I had to like I have to, I, she's I go well all right you got to throw that away. She's like no you throw it away. And I go well then you got to look out because I was going to go ahead and keep an eye out. So nobody went ahead and said, what are those people putting in the garbage can? And uh, so, I, you know, she goes and she's like, she's posted as a lookout. And then I tuck it under my arm and I, I you know, I immediately give a stiff arm to a couple of guys. I juke and I cut a few times and I dive over the pile for a touchdown because it's gigantic. 
And uh, so finally I get over and I, and you know, I, I'm never, I can't just throw something away with, you know, cause I'm very bad, even in like auditions, I'm bad at space work and I'm bad at business. I'm bad at pretending I'm on a phone. I'm bad at, I'm pretending to eat or sewing. I always just look like a, a bear swatting a beehive, no matter what they ask me to do. So I'd come over with this thing and I, you know, tiptoe over to the garbage can and I, this is, I literally did this. I went to throw it away and I actually coughed. I was like, <laughs> threw it away. What are you covering up? If anything, you drew attention to everybody going, hey, who's the guy with whooping cough over there throwing away a child's wading pool? Who's that? What did that guy just stuff in the garbage can that's going to explode and kill hundreds? Who's that guy with the flu who's up to no good? I coughed. Unbelievable. <laughs> Throw it away. And it makes this huge clonk into the garbage can. I look at Karen, she just looks at me, and I'm like, yeah, no more. Uh, let's not travel anymore with our sex toys. She's like, fantastic. That's a plan. I am down with that plan. Get on the plane and flew home. And uh, and I can only assume that trip was not nearly as exciting as it should have been for my wife. <laughs> I don't know. She was going to stay at her mom's house. Like, I mean, like, who is it? Her mom used to be a nun. You really want your mom to find the 80-pound vibrator that you brought from California? She doesn't like me as it is. Now she thinks I'm getting replaced by a piece of plastic. Jesus Christ. It's funny. Karen's wife did use to, Karen's wife. Karen's mom used to be a nun. She was a nun, and then she stopped being a nun and had kids. <laughs> Didn't even know they could do that. I thought something. I thought you became a nun and everything got sewn up or moved around or something. You know, they. I don't know what happened. But uh, yeah, her mom jumped the fence, met her dad, and said, "Yep, this guy's more charming than God. Let's go." Uh, they don't listen to the podcast, by the way. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. Uh, they, they uh, I, that was funny. I, I'm, I think that that actually made me laugh, and uh, and that would not go over well with them. Again, uh, this might be the reason they don't like me. All right, so they don't dislike me. They like me. They're nice people. Uh, they've come around on me. Uh, I call them Mister and Mrs. Their last name, uh, which they can't, you know, they wanted me to call them mom. And I'm like, I got a mom, please. The last thing I'm going to do is call you mom. And uh, it was funny. When I met Karen, uh, her, mom, her mom is a real uh, domineering presence and personality. And uh, I think Karen, this is the moment Karen, Karen fell in love with me, I think. I met her family for the first time at a picnic at her sister's house. And uh, I got there and I couldn't believe her mom. Her mom would just sit there and like order everybody to do everything. And by everybody, I mean Karen. Like she made Karen do everything for her brother and her two sisters and their kids. And like, Karen, get this. Karen, get that. Karen, do this. Karen, do that. And Karen would just do it. She was really nice. And uh, Karen lived with her family when I met her. And uh, she was very much the, the put upon daughter, in my opinion. And she would wind up doing everything. And not that everybody else didn't have their thing going on, but Karen seemed to get the brunt of it. And uh, this is my first time meeting them. I'm there and her mom is ordering everybody around. And, uh, and by or everybody, I mean Karen. So then at one point, her nephew has a plate of food, and he sits down, and she goes, Karen, I, I can't do, all right, yeah, she has a voice like that, but I'm not going to do it. She goes, Karen, uh, Karen, all right, so she, <laughs> again, they don't listen, so I don't think I'm in that much danger, except if my wife hears this, she's going to punch me with a stripper pussy hand, so she's going to just get a handful of red licorice and punch me right in the face, so she, uh, uh, Karen's mom goes, Karen, can't you see that Kevin doesn't have a fork? Can't you see that? Get him a fork right now. He's eating. Can't you see that? And I, I'm standing there, and I went, I looked over at my mom, and I went, hey, your legs aren't broke. Why don't you get him a fork? <laughs> and it was like, it was that, that commercial where, you know, again, my age group will realize there was a commercial about Merrill Lynch where, like, everybody shut up and leaned in. But it was, it was again, it was the typical, stereotypical the sound of the record player skipping, everybody froze. Because I, just, I, cause I was standing there and I looked at her and I, and I just said, hey, your legs don't look broke. Why don't you get him a fork? And there was a beat and it was quiet and, and, I, just, and I just smirked. Because again, I'm a comedian. I can get away with this kind of thing. It's like, you know, I can, hey, he's, the, he's funny. He can say that. Ha ha. He's not a jerk, even though he is a jerk. But, uh, but honestly, I, just, I was tired of seeing Karen get uh, uh, hammered. I mean, it was just, I couldn't believe it. She was there with me, spent some time with me. And, you know, so I guess in a roundabout way, it was selfish of me. I, was, I wanted her to spend time with me. Hey, get me a fork. We're dating. I need some silverware. Unfortunately, she had to pay attention to everybody else. The hell with that. Pay attention to me. This is about me. Uh, so I said that, and uh, it, there was like, everybody got quiet. And everybody looked at her mom, and her mom 
got like a slow like smile on her face like oh like she realized i guess kind of oh okay this dynamic has entered the equation <laughs> but smiled and then uh her brother said that's okay i'll get him a fork and karen i looked at her face and she looked like she i mean it looked like no one had ever stuck up for her in her life because she had this look on her face I, and like i said i fully believe that was the second she fell in love with me like i think she was she was just like yeah that's it i'm on board with this guy i don't care if he's a jerk the rest of our lives and uh, and i've tested that theory believe me i've tested it uh but i think she'll always just sit down and go yeah the fork i remember that that was great that was when i really loved him when he turned out to be really cool yeah. uh yeah, her mom was a nun. This is like the second girl I've dated. Uh, uh, I guess Karen and I are more than dating at this point. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll give it a little more. We're, at, we're having a trial marriage. and This, <laughs> this is a trial 15-year relationship. We're seeing how it works. Uh, <laughs> so actually, one of the first girls I ever uh, like dated, and dated isn't really the word, uh, first girl I ever uh, drooled all over as a kid had a uh, and it's funny I think I think of this girl today because we went to Olive Garden for lunch and uh, we walked in and there was a girl sitting in the middle of the dining room and I mean all eyes went to this girl because she was just a battleship I mean she was just a big girl she was about like six foot tall with a gigantic shelf and like a pretty face like if, if she would have had glasses honestly they would have had to hold me down and get and throw a blanket over her and sneak her out the back door because i may have just done uh, anything i possibly could to get next to this girl because that's uh, it's, it's just me man pretty face and glasses and big tits forget about it i'm in so she just was sitting in the middle of the room and was statuesque i mean she was just just a huge rack and uh and i saw her and i was like whoa and she looked like the first girl uh, that I ever went, uh, I, we didn't even go out. I mean, we just, we went round and round for a while. Her name was Shauna Johnston. And, uh, and it was funny because my brother and his, and his friends would like, they were teasing me. This is my freshman year. And she was uh, a sophomore. And, uh, which of course is, that's a big coup for me. I'm like, all right, let's go. And, uh, and, and my friends called her the Siberian land cruiser. That's what my brother and his friends, because she was like six foot tall and like big wide shoulders and uh, she, you know, she had everything but a dick. I mean, that's, that's basically it. You know, she looked, but she was hot. I mean, I didn't care. And I dug her. And uh, she was one of those girls. She was the girl like, you pre you know, when you're 13 and you don't know what you're doing, like you wind up practicing. Like I went over to her babysitting. She was babysitting one night. And uh, I went over there and it was that thing where you're just like, all of a sudden we're just both naked in the kitchen. Like, I mean, and you're just like, it, she's on the countertop. Cause I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And then I, I'm going to go down on her. I'm 13. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm ready. I'm just going face first and seeing what happens. Let's go. And, uh, and then she goes down on me, but she's not doing anything. And I don't know what she's supposed to be. Yeah. We technically, again, it's, it's, it was like Christmas when you just open a toy and you don't know how it works, but you're playing with it anyway. You don't fucking care. Let's go. What's this, a truck? Let's just start rolling it around. I'm certain sparks will shoot out of it. Something will fucking happen. Let's do it. I've never used this with somebody else before. Let's see how it works when we go together in tandem. Because uh, she didn't want to uh, have sex sex. Like, she didn't want to do that. So I was, I'm sticking my dick anywhere else. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, under the sink, in her ear. I didn't care. As long as it was somewhere kind of warm, I was on board. And these kids are like sleeping in the other room, and uh, and I, you know, like I said, we're just going at it. I've got her on the countertop. Like I'm, I don't know, nine and a half weeks isn't even out yet, and yet I've that's my move. I'm 13. I got a chick on the kitchen countertop at a house she's babysitting at. Those people are gonna make pasta on that countertop. Those people are making their children peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on that countertop, and I got her, uh, you know, bare ass up there with her feet on my shoulders, and I'm I'm looking around for a map, going, all right, what do I do now? I don't know. But I'm ready to do it. Let's try it. So, uh, uh, so basically, since she doesn't want to, she doesn't know how to do that, and I don't know how to do that, and uh, and she doesn't want to fuck. She's she's just like, all right, well, let's just make out forever. And I'm like, that's fine. I'm on board. So uh, when you're 13, that's great. So it's that like three hour marathon session, and uh, 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 you know, and uh, you know, periodically, like I said, she, you know slide her mouth onto my dick but not do anything like she doesn't know what to do and it, we, none of us know what to do at all and uh li literally what we should have done is we could have turned on just cinemax and said oh look that's what we're supposed to be doing come on <laughs> um, but it's you know like i said she, she's doing that whatever so uh we w three hours we start giving each other hickeys 
And I mean, and I mean, not like just like, oh, uh, here's a, a nice hickey for you. It's like, hey, I wonder if I could eat all the way through to the other side of your neck. You know, because you're 13 and she's 15 and I, we don't have any idea. We just know that it feels great. So I'm chewing on her neck. She's chewing on mine. I mean, we're going off. I'm chewing on, you know, I'm chewing on her shoulders and this and her, her breasts. And it's like we're all over one another just biting. Because we, there's so much frustration from not being able to get off that we're just biting one another. And we're just, I, I imagine it to be like what monkeys do in the wild. When they can't, they, they don't know what to do and they can't have sex. So they're just like, fuck it. Let's just keep biting one another until something happens. <laughs> So I'm chewing on her, she's chewing on me, and we're going off. I mean, it is just like like an hour of hickeys, like m- massive. And uh, finally, we stop, we kind of get our breath after an hour of just relentless chewing. And I look at her, and she looks at me, and we look like we've been in an accident. We, I, 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 I am so bruised up. I, I look like I was in a boxing match. I look like... Uh, I, I, you know, I look like Ray Boom Boom Mancini. That's what my he- my neck looks like. Ray Bam- Boom Boom Mancini's face. It's all swollen and bruised. I mean, it is just crazy. And she looks like I've been strangling her for an hour. She's just complete. And we're just like, well, I mean, this feels great, but wow, that all right. This is this isn't good. I mean, because it's like on her breasts and her shoulders. I mean, she because we're completely naked in the kitchen still. Like then we're in the yard. Then we went in the yard because we're like, hey, we shouldn't do this in the kitchen because the kids are here. Let's go in the backyard. I'm sure the neighbors won't mind two naked teenagers going at it by the tool shed. So we're just like, it was so funny. Like when someone would babysit and you'd go to their house, it was like all of a sudden they owned the house. Like you could do whatever you wanted. So we're naked in the yard chewing on one another. And when we, by the time we finished, I swear to God, I, I looked like, uh, uh, you, I, you know, remember when the guy pulls all this, his skin off in poltergeist? That's what my neck looked like. Now, I was supposed to be home, my curfew, I was supposed to be home by 11. So, uh, but my mom was out. Uh, I think I mentioned when my mom would get a call from Bob, you pretty much knew that you were, you had carte blanche for the night. You could do whatever the hell you wanted because my mom was going to go get laid and then we weren't going to, we didn't have to be around. So, uh, uh, but you see, you know, the only thing I had to worry about was my brother Lenny. All, all he's got to do is cover for me when my mom calls and then that's fine. So I'm supposed to be home by 11. So uh, uh, I'm with Shauna. We're going at it. We're naked. We're uh, bruised. And uh, literally, we we looked like if the cops had come, we'd both been arrested. They would have gotten us both for uh, assault. Uh, but Sean and I went at it. And then I finally, I look at the clock and it's 12.15. So I'm super late. So uh, I have to get dressed and uh, I have to, uh, you know, we got to call over like four people to wedge my heart on into my pants. And uh, I get dressed and uh, I, I have to run home because I'm, I'm uh, uh, on the other side of Route 53. It's like, you know, I'm about a mile from where I live. So, uh, or two miles, not a mile. So I got I to gotta get home. So I book and I run and uh, I get there and uh, uh, I get home and Lenny's like, where have you been? And I think I've told you in another episode that my brother was notorious uh, for selling me out. <laughs> Lenny was a guy who would constantly, like he just, he had no concept of uh, covering for your brother or, you know, everything. The first thing out of his mouth uh, one time, Mike knew and then I got in trouble. <laughs> so I, go, I get home, I get home about 1240. And uh, uh, he goes, you were supposed to be home at 1130. I go, I know, but mom's not here. He goes, well, she called. She's called twice. And I go, yeah, and you told her I was here, right? And he goes, no. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you weren't here, dude. I'm like, are you kidding me? You ass. You know I'm out. What are you doing? You you actually? So uh, he tells my mom that I'm not there. And then my mom, of course, being the good parent, is like, oh, well, I'm going to stay here and get laid. But when I, I get home tomorrow, you're in trouble. So uh, he says, Mom wants you to call when you get here. It, because that's, and that's the worst. Because then it's like you can't, uh, you know, you have to call. I mean, because, uh, but I didn't. I didn't call. I just decided, you know what, I'm late. She knows I'm late. She doesn't know, have, to, have to know how late I was. I go, when did she last call? He goes, she called uh, like 15 minutes ago, which is about 1225. And I go, great. I got home at 1230. As far as you know, she knows that. I know that. Everything's fine. And I'm not going to call her. Uh, and I figure I'm going to get in trouble for being late. No big deal. So I get up the next morning and, uh, uh, my mom uh, is there and uh, I come downstairs and she's like, uh, what the fuck happened last night? And I go, well, I, I'm sorry, ma, I was late. And she goes, "Uh uh-huh. And I go, I know I was, I got home at 1230 and, and, uh, I, I was supposed to call you. I'm so sorry that I didn't call you. 
uh, but you know, the, I, I apologize and, and uh, you know, I, I, and I, I go, I know I'm at, and she goes, it's not what I'm talking about. What the fuck happened to you last night? I go, what are you, nothing. I went out and then, uh, you know, I was out with Mike Scott. Mm-hmm. No, I wasn't. And, uh, and then I, I came home. She goes, you look in a mirror this morning. And I go, uh, no. She goes, go look in a fucking mirror and then come back here and tell me what happened last night. <laughs> I go in the bathroom, and it looks like I was at Abu Ghraib. I mean, it is crazy. I, I, it looks like I was in a car accident, and the and I flew out of the car and skidded on my neck for 50 yards on the asphalt. I have black and blue. Like you've seen hickeys. These, th- these. These were bordering on lesions. These were just, I mean, because, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little tale out of school here. I like getting bitten. So I was into it even at 13. So, and uh, she was as well, and she was all for it. Cause, and Shona, again, big girl, big jaw. I mean, she had just unhinged it and went, and she actually had a second jaw, like the alien. Like, she was biting me with one jaw, and then the alien jaw shot out and started biting me as well. And I was all for it. I didn't care. You could have tied me down in the yard and had like nine people come by and bite me, and I would have been all over it. So she's chewing on me uh, like a like a, a dog toy, and I didn't. I was like, "Yes, keep going. You can't bite me hard enough." And uh, I look at myself in the mirror, and it it just it is crazy. It looks like I tried to hang myself, didn't die, but hung there in the noose for about six hours. It's just black and blue. From my earlobes down to my shoulders, all the way around my neck. And I come walking out of the bathroom. And she's like, tell me again you were with Mike last night. And I was like, no, I was out. And, I, and then, then, you know, when you're 13, unfortunately, your mom, my mom is like, who is, who is this girl? Who is this girl? And I go, you don't know her. She's Shauna. You know, she's like, I want her fucking phone number right now. I go, Ma, you're, no, I don't have her phone number. Uh, we just started uh, dating, and uh, I I haven't uh, you know written uh, you know anything, and she's like I want that girl's fucking phone number. I want her last name right now because I, I don't know what she did to you. I don't know I don't know why you allowed it, and I'm like what ma? It was nothing. We were just you know da da. And she's like what else did you do with this girl? I go nothing. And part of me wanted to go nothing. That's why my neck looks like this because we were like a couple of snapping turtles who couldn't get out of the shell. And all we had to work with was our mouth, so we went bananas. And my mom is just like, I want that phone number. And I'm like, Ma, I, I, I'm not, I don't have her phone number. I'll get it. I'll get it Monday at school. She's like, you fucking better. So Shauna's dad was a preacher. And Shauna didn't really have as much of a problem giving up my phone number as I did giving up hers. Within a half an hour, bring phone rings at my house. It's Shauna's dad wants to talk to my dad. Well, since my dad's a drunk who's in the ground, he's not going to be chatting with you. But here we go. Let's get my mom, who's going to be a lot more fun to talk to anyway. I'm sure my dad, my dad would have been like, ah, who cares? It's fucking hickeys. Big deal. And then he would have pulled some early times out of the linen closet and passed out. My mom, however, is just spoiling for a fight. So she picks up the phone, and I hear her going at it with this guy. Because he's calling about what his daughter looks like. Like, he can't believe it, and he can't believe it. What did your son do to my daughter? And my mom goes, hey. I hear my mom. She just goes, hello? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, this is Pat Pat Schmidt. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. No. No. Hey, 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 no, no, what did your daughter do to my fucking son? That's what I heard. Because I know exactly, that's what I know he said, what did your son do to my daughter? My mama, what did your daughter do to my fucking son? You know, he's sitting here now, he looks like he was in a goddamn fucking brawl last night. What the fuck happened? And my mom's swearing. And again, this guy's a preacher. So he's got a violated daughter that he's staring at. And meanwhile, he's talking to this maniac on the phone. I'm sure he expected some demure person or, you know, my, even my dad. But my mom is going bananas. 
because she's she all of the anger she has at me is now getting vented right now at <laughs> at the at fucking preacher Jones, and he's eating it. He's just compl- He's like, well, I picture him finally get, just getting shouted down and going, well, uh, ba, er, uh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, because my mom is relentless. And uh, hey, you know what? Maybe I, you know what? Maybe I bring my son over there and show you what he fucking looks like. Maybe I take a fucking picture and I mail it to you. Is that what you want to see? You want to see what he looks like? This is unbelievable. So, uh, Sean and I didn't date much after that, as if we were dating anyway. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it was funny seeing that girl today at the Olive Garden brought all that back. Where I was like, oh yeah, hey, I remember Sean. God, I wonder what ever happened to her. I hope she healed, because <laughs> I I went through I was chewing her like a pack of gum I went I went off. She might still have teeth marks in her. It was crazy. I mean, we were just oh, just that teen sexual frustration you're working out, you know, through your jaw because you you can't use any other part of your body, and uh and this is on a Friday, so then uh, you know and again I I've got I'm crazy bruised like black and blue, so I got to go to school Monday. So uh, I show up for school one day, and uh, like I told you, my brother and, and his friends are, you know, they're all making fun of me because, uh, you know, I'm dating Shauna anyway. They think it's hilarious. And, uh, uh, you know, but I, I, who fucking cares? Look what I did this weekend. You know, you, you sat at home and took co- phone calls from mom, prick. <laughs> I was off getting assaulted while you sat at home and watched Fridays. <laughs> Talked to my mom on the phone and shepherded, where, you know, and, and blew my cover, you dick. Make fun of me all you want. I had a better weekend. But that was the, you know, that's the older guys. That's like Lenny and his friends. My friends are all like, I, I, was, I might as well have been Anthony Michael Hall and 16 Candles. I walk in and they're just like, yeah! Because again, it's, just, it's me and plus it's a sophomore. They didn't, it didn't matter to them. You know what I mean? You're getting laid. You're, you're 13 years old and you're quote unquote getting laid. I could have been banging my cousin. They would have been like, yeah, dude! That's great news! Uh, but yeah, I went to school, and it was like, and I, I have expected a teacher to come over and just go, um, "Is everything all right at home?" <laughs> because I looked, I mean, I had been hammered. It was crazy, and uh, and Shauna came to school too, and she uh, she uh, she wore a turtleneck. She was smart. I didn't care. I wore a tank top. What the fuck? Look at this. Look what I did this weekend, everybody. Uh, <laughs> and she actually wound up moving because uh, this was in May of my freshman year and then uh she went to camp for the summer and then she she wasn't back after the summer like their family moved to virginia uh which is where preacher dads take their 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 nasty daughters i I picture virginia every house is just a a religious father and a a daughter who can't wait to fuck the first guy who comes to the door (laughs) so suck on that virginia i've only been there once but that's the impression i get of your state i was in uh where was i at richmond i did the funny boat in richmond that was great i had a great week that week uh, I should have gone door to door because I probably would have got laid. Because it was just a, it's a bunch of preachers with their daughters under lock and key. And they're just waiting for a mailman to make his way. Uh, it's special delivery. Uh, get in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was, the, uh, uh, that was the, the, the first actual real crazy uh, uh, sexual nonsense uh, <laughs> that, that occurred. I don't know why. You're not asking. Who cares? What did I my, who cares? It might not have been the first. Hey, I was eight years old. I got laid. Suck on that. All right. So, uh, hey, I got to tell you guys this. Uh, well, first of all, you can write me at Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. Go ahead and write me there, please. And, uh, or go to MySpace.com slash MikeSchmidtComedy and send me a comment or uh, go ahead and leave a comment or write me a message uh, and uh, enjoy it. Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com, MySpace.com slash MikeSchmidtComedy. And uh, visit me in those places. Go ahead and subscribe in iTunes if you haven't already. Or go ahead and get the feed through SwitchPod, which you probably do if you are listening to this right now. I'm dumb. Uh, and the show, if you, if you don't have any of those machines, why am I telling you this? Who cares? All right, so. Uh, also, I want to tell you, I was on Paul Goebel's podcast last week, the Paul Goebel Show, with the very funny Paul Goebel and Jim Bruce. They had me on. And, uh, and, and I'm doing Goebel's show. All right, I got to tell you this. I'm doing Goebel's show. And... Uh, I'm a little free with the language. I'm not going to lie with you folks. Uh, I've been known to maybe curse every now and then, if that's the way you want to call it. Uh, I, I swear sometimes. And so we're talking, and I don't know, I, I think it was, we were talking about banging a chick or something, and then I said, fuck, like nine times. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not good for that. So there, there, there's an explicit tag on this show for a reason. 
Uh, not just for the fact that apparently me and another girl turned each other into skeletons one night <laughs> as we chewed the skin off each other's body. Uh, but I'm at Goebel's house and we're talking. And I'm, you know, we're, you know, and, and we're doing the podcast. And in the middle of it, his daughter walks out of the back room and she's like, hey, uh, uh, it was uh, daddy. You know, she had a question about what was going on. And he's like, oh, hold on, sweetheart. I don't know if he left it in the show, but she walks out, and I just hear her voice behind me. I didn't even turn around. I just put my head in my hands. And I go, well, seriously, Gracie's here? And uh, he goes, yeah. Well, you didn't know my kids were here? No, I didn't know your kids were here. I didn't. You know why? Because you've got them in the back room. I didn't know. I didn't take a walkthrough of your entire house to find out that your kids were here. How horrible is that for them that they're wedged into a back bedroom while Daddy and his two jackass friends talking to a matchstick microphone? about Tropic Thunder. Let's play ball with your kids if I'm going to come over, okay? I mean, or at least have them on the show, or at least maybe we warn me so I don't talk about, uh, you know, I don't use the terms asshat and fuckstick with them it's so close. <laughs> Terrible. I, I, just unbelievable. Who does that? Who? I, I, you know what I even picture? I picture them, they're not even in a room. I picture they're in a giant chest of drawers. <laughs> he just opened them and says, all right, you guys lay down in here. Zhunk, we'll be in to get you in a couple hours. Come on, let them out. See, this is why I choose to have friends with no kids to, to record uh, in their homes. So I can swear and talk about nonsense. All right, so, but go get the, the Paul Goebel Show episode that I'm on. Uh, we had a lot of fun, and I appreciate them guys. Uh, them guys. Oh, God, I'm from Chicago. And uh, so that was great. So, again, Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com, MySpace.com slash MikeSchmidtComedy. And also, don't forget to get the Paul Goebel Show that I was a part of. And also, September 5th, Please remember, I will plug that now, and I'll plug it again next week at the UCB Theater. ComedyFilmNerds.com is doing a comedy show. I don't know if we're talking just about movies and stuff, uh, but I'll be there being funny. It'll be me and uh, Chris Mancini and Graham Elwood and Chris Hardwick and Jackie Cation. And uh, there's another very funny person, Maria Bamford, will be there. So come out to uh, the show on September 5th at the UCB Theater. should be a lot of fun. And uh, Oh, and don't forget to buy Season 1 of Never Not Funny. Uh, that is available through the store link on my website. And uh, buy them. You know, Christmas is coming up. So I think what you should do is go ahead and buy the uh, Season 1 of Never Not Funny. And uh, I guess you could buy Season 2 and 3. I don't, I don't know if they're are they available. They might be available for those guys. But uh, buy Season 1. That's the really important one because <laughs> that's the one that I get paid for. So by all means, go ahead and buy Season 1. And, uh, yeah, so now I'm going to go ahead and go to the airport, folks. I think I'm going to go a little early. It's uh, only five hours early, but I'll go there. I'll sleep out. I'll get ready. I'll get excited. And uh, I guess I can't wait because I, I just I got nothing. And I'm trying to clean up now. It's funny because I uh, not only I'm a neat guy. I'm a guy who actually takes, I, I you know, because just for my own sanity, because I know I'm a kind of guy who can slip into letting things accumulate, uh, I, I I haven't made the bed at all since my wife's been gone, which is weird because I, you know, but it's because I'm in this weird graveyard mode again, where I crawl into bed at six in the morning and then uh, I just crawl out at one. And by that time I'm like, I don't even want to waste any time making the bed. I got to go ahead and get ready for the day uh, that I've pissed away by sleeping until one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, it's just, and then, you know, but I don't even know why, but there's no reason to get up because my wife's not here. Why would I get up? Uh -huh. You know why I get up? Because maybe she called. Oh my God. What if she called? Wouldn't that be great? Because then I could hear her voice. Folks, I am pathetic. I have nothing. I have nothing going on. You would think that I would have done something good in the time that she's been gone. Uh, I'm doing laundry at Lily's house today, trying to catch up because it's like I don't want to. Uh, because at my house, uh, in my apartment, you know, they got two uh, two laundry, two washers, two dryers, and for some reason, there's one a person in my building who I think is taking in wash from from friends or neighbors or or just the 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 indigent. I don't know who she's doing clothes for, but she will bring like a shopping cart of clothes in there and then you know that she's going to camp out and you know you have no shot at doing clothes, but she's in there, you know, stirring clothes in a kettle with a boat oar. You know what I mean? It's like it's like Charlie's mom from Willy Wonka. She lives in my building, and she's taking in mountains of wash. And then you sit there, and you're like, look, i got to have a clean shirt. Sorry, I have about 75 loads, and then you can go next. Well, thanks. That seems great. And you know what? It's a buck twenty-five to wash, seventy-five to dry. So that's two. So I got to figure, what could they be paying? Like, are they paying certain for a pound? Because I know they do laundry by the pound. And uh, uh, I, I, which is a great way, by the way, to pay for anything that isn't food. If you're buying anything by the pound, they should sell everything by the pound. Like, you should be able to go to a bookstore and buy books by the pound. It's uh, you know, funny. My buddy uh, Dave and I wrote a sketch about that called Books by the Pound. And uh, just like that, to me, it's, that's what it's like when you go to Walden Books and they have that cart outside with a bunch of books. And it's just like books for a dollar. 
Like, they don't even give a fuck what's in those books. Who walks up and just goes, you know what, I'm going to spend $5. I'm getting $5 worth of books. And they just grab five. Because there's nothing ever good on those on those racks. It's always like, you know, the, the history of gems. Nobody wants to know the history of gems. Certainly not worth a dollar to me, quite frankly. Or it's like, uh, you know, uh, I'm okay, you're fucked. Well, great, I'll pick up that book for a dollar. That's fantastic. I don't, I don't want to see those. But for some reason, they think that people are going to go ahead and buy books just for... Uh, nobody wants discount books. If you're buying a book, you're buying a specific book. Nobody's buying a book because it's cheap. Nobody's like, oh, man, I would really love to read that. I'm going to wait till it goes down in price. No, people want to read information. Nobody's waiting for discount information because that information is flawed. If any book that's for free or any book that you're selling by the pound is not a book that anybody wants. You know what? If you're selling those books outside that there and it's a buck a book, a buck a book is just to hold up a wobbly table at your house. That's it. That's the only reason you would spend a buck a book. A buck a book is to go ahead and get, oh, you know what? I need something heavy to hold down some papers at my house. It's a paperweight. It's a paperweight with words inside. That's what it is. guy i am not a good guy but i don't think i'm a bad person overall so uh and go ahead and by all means judge that <laughs> i'm kind of a jag off i got the future what am i talking about but i am a jag off uh, and i'm not a jerk i'm a nice guy it's just i guess i have jerky tendency i've done so much ridiculous stuff and then i, I wonder afterwards i'm like man how come i don't uh, hang out with anybody here's why because you're a dick Ladies, I'm a biter, and I like to be bitten. Uh, that was episode 23, I believe, from year one. My teeth are strong. And uh, again, according to past me, when I typed up the liner notes, that show was fucking hilarious. So I can only hope it lived up to the hype. But I will tell you this. Flavor Flay would tell you don't believe the hype. But he would, he would also say he was lamping and lamping and cold, cold lamping. So who the fuck believes anything that Flavor Flav has to say? Goes to the graveyard. He puts gravy on it. All right. Uh, hey, so we've got clips galore. And I should end it here, right? Shouldn't I just end it here? Shouldn't I say, well, there's the Ron Say story. And then there's a full episode from year one. That's more than enough show for anybody. But here's the thing. I'll tell you this. The Ron Say story is only like 15 minutes long. Like I thought it was going to be longer when I was putting this show together. And I actually consulted my friend Max. Confulted? Consulted? I mean, that time I mixed an S and an F. Dude, the S. Just why, why is my aversion to S's? Like I, <laughs> I replaced an S with a T. I replaced an S with an F. Um... I talked to my friend David Hernandez last night. He is the genius behind all of the artwork and the music for this show. And he actually should be the one doing this show, quite frankly. Because, again, as you know, Lily is off with a lay around her neck and she's doing the hula somewhere, hoping her back doesn't go out and the Brady kids have to go and get a fucking idol out of the cave. And I, I'm in Milwaukee, uh, and I think I'm at Rick Springfield with Jill on my shoulders. And uh, she may even be facing the stage. Um, so, who knows? <laughs> if it was my choice, she wouldn't be. But that's fine. Um, so here's the deal, folks, uh, with Ron say only being 15 minutes. And then of course the full episode of year one, I said, why not throw in another, uh, another clip? Cause when I had talked to Max, he recommended this clip.
And I honestly cannot remember if we used this clip in a clip show previous. We may have. We may not have. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't fucking matter because it's a, uh, I, it's a great story. It's a story I love to tell. It's a story I actually told on the Risk podcast. Uh, what's that face? What are you saying? It's a tale as old as time. It certainly is. <laughs> I mean, look, this show's been around forever, folks. This is a legendary... <laughs> This is my Ed Ames throwing a tomahawk into somebody's balls story. That's what this story is. Um, Ed Ames as Mingo throwing a tomahawk into my balls. It is, uh, this is a story I told on the Risk podcast. I told it live at the UCB Theater. And then Risk used it and actually closed their show with it. And then I think it was also on their year-end show. And, uh, and to show what an impression I made on Kevin Allison, never heard from the man again. Uh, I wanted to do live stuff. I wanted to do, you know, I would have gone to New York and done it there. Like, I, I would love to do more stuff. Um, but I think he wants me to take his storytelling class, which I should. Perhaps I should, because I would love to have Kevin Allison tell me how to make tell a story. I'm going to shut up now before I get in trouble. Uh, no, that's awesome. Good for him. Whatever. It's a kind. Con- if you can make money and teaching people how to talk, good for you. Um, but yeah, so I did the Risk podcast, and I, I think I've talked about the process where I submitted the story, and then he kind of graded it. And I was like, fantastic. All right, so I'm going to shut up. Um, but yeah, so I have not done uh, the show since. And I, and truth be told, it's not like, I'm also a child. It's not like I'm, because you're supposed to submit stories to risk. So I'm like, I should be I should be ringing up Kevin or sending him emails and going, hey, I'd love to do the show again, and here's why. Um, but instead, I'm waiting for Kevin Allison to go, you know, you know, calling all cars, calling all cars, find Mike Schmidt, he's got to do a great story for us again. You know what I mean? It's like, I demand uh, someone to beat down my door. I'd prefer to hide under the coats and wait for them to find me. Uh, this is a story about um, the most expensive birthday I ever spent. Uh, in my but this life. birthday is, is gonna—it's gonna be great. And, uh, whatever happens, I'm sure. I've had—I've uh, had good birthdays and bad birthdays. Like I had. Uh, uh, oh Christ! All right, I'll tell you this story. I was in um, when I was in Lake Tahoe, folks. Uh, that was—I uh, was sowing my wild oats when I was in Lake Tahoe. A lot of—a lot of did a lot of things. I lived—I lived in a, an apartment with like six different dudes for a while, and we. Uh, you know, there was drinking going on, and I didn't, I didn't really drink, but I've, I've been drunk a few times, and uh, most, a few of those were in Tahoe. So, here's what happened one night. Uh, it was my birthday, and uh, I went out that night, and uh, the, uh, the girl that I was uh, banging at the time happened to be uh, home with her husband. So there was, uh, <laughs> I unfortunately, uh, I was not going to have her uh, with me. So I was like, hey, let's go to the bar and look for uh, some other female companionship. So. Uh, uh, I, I wound up, I was working at the time at a health club. And this was after, when I was in town, I lived with, uh, you know, for a while I lived in a, in a woman's house. You know, this is back the guy who tried to kill himself. And then I wound up moving in with friends. And then there was, there were four of us sharing a two-bedroom apartment. And then that grew to six. And then eventually that thinned out. Everybody bailed and it was just me and my buddy Ransom. So that's who it was. Me and Ransom lived in the apartment. And we had, you know, two people in a two-bedroom house. How novel. Uh, but that's what we did. So, uh we're, you know, this is at the time when I was, uh, uh, like I said, I worked in a health club during the day and, uh, I was, uh, you know, at the gym and, uh, so whatever I went and I got ready to go out. We were going to go out for my birthday. So th- that night, uh, I think it was my 22nd birthday. Was it 89? Yeah. It was 22nd. Yeah, I believe so. Cause then I moved in late 89. So it was my 22nd birthday. And, uh, we went out to the clubs and we were looking for ladies and we were dancing and we were having a good time because folks, I can move again. I think I may have told you that I'm uh, and you'll learn all about that in, uh, in, in the blog in the coming weeks as I go out dancing. <laughs> what have I did? What if I, that was my exercise. I went dancing. I'm an idiot. Uh, it was funny. Oh, you know, it's funny. Karen was dancing in the house the other day and she was not moving. She was just dancing in one spot. And I was like, what are you, what are you doing? She goes, she goes, I've invented a dance box. I said, what do you mean? She goes, you just dance. It's like you dance. It's a designated box where you dance, like a dance spot where you don't move. You just stand there and dance. I said, that goes against everything dance stands for. <laughs> dance is free expression. Dance is all over the place. I, I said, you know what? Kevin Bacon would be very angry with you right now. Because dance is all about leaping into a barn and jumping into a haystack and doing a flip. That's what dancing is. That ain't dancing. This is dancing. <laughs> But she, uh, she's like got her dance box, so she's not moving. That's it. She's in her little, and she's not. I said, all right, if that's what you want to do, but that that quashes all free expression. I thought dancing was all about, you know, fucking Alvin Ailey and fucking being all over the place and Martha Graham and doing leaps and twirls and a jump and a spin and a knickerbocker twist and a smile, as David Lee Roth would say. And uh, yeah, but unfortunately, she's got a dance box. So I, apparently, folks, you mean you need to dance in a spot. You have to have a. Let's all get a dance box, and that you can bring it with you wherever you go. 
wherever you want to go, they have a dance box and just dance in that dance box. And everybody says what you're doing. You're just like, I'm in the dance box. That's a good idea. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm on board now with the dance box. <laughs> it sort of quashes individualism. It quashes individual expression, but I think it encourages expression. Uh, like it quite. Uh, no, it doesn't encourage expression, really. Is that what I want to say? No, it it it. <laughs> How did I even get to talking about this? Because I thought because it made me laugh that she had a dance box. Like I was like, dancing is all about dancing all over the fucking place. It's it's, you know, it's it's all about holding out for a hero and and uh, you and teaching Chris Penn the hillbilly how to dance that's what it's about but she apparently feels that it's okay if you dance in one spot so there you go so bring your dance box wherever you go i guess that's what i'm saying to combat (laughs) because it does quash individual expression the dance box but if you bring your dance box anywhere you want to go and you put it down and then you dance in that dance box then you are still individually expressing yourself just in a smaller area so i guess all right to sum up if you want to go dancing, dance all over the place. But if you want to dance anywhere in the world that doesn't have dancing, bring your dance box. So when you go dancing, do not restrict yourself to a dance box, but always bring your dance box with you so you can dance like at a gas station. Okay, there you go. I've solved the uh, the riddle of the dance box. Uh, so that, that way, that way you can still express yourself, but in a small area. Maybe that's what she meant all along. Maybe she meant that you shouldn't, that because she had a dance box at the house, it meant not to jump all over the house. Fuck, how did I get caught in this loop? How did I get caught in the dance box loop? What the hell was I talking about? My, uh, dancing in Tahoe. All right, so we went out dancing. It's my birthday, and uh, uh, and again, folks, I have game, or at least I did when I was 22. So I'm dancing with some ladies, but I'm uh, trying to do everything I can to get them to possibly come back uh, to my apartment. I'm doing everything, you know, or or I'll go to their place, or we'll go to a parking lot. Who cares? I don't care at this point. <laughs> All I know is I'm a walking hard on. I'm 22 years old, so I'm I'm looking around, and uh, suffice to say, I, I I will tell you too, there was a girl that I was crushing on at the time when I lived in Tahoe. There was a girl that I always had a thing for. And uh, and never, unfortunately, uh, got to uh, uh, got to the finish line with. She was great. She was a great friend. It was one of those deals where I saw her all. You know, like I'd see her all day. I'd see her all night. We hung out all the time. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, she but well, she was married. But like was you know, I, I couldn't penetrate that wall. Let's put it that way. Uh, but I got to be friends with her and her kids, and, and we got to be really you know really good friends. And uh, and then we, I mean, I ruined her marriage eventually, but not in the way I wanted to. So <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, so, uh, so I was like really uh, heavily into her, and she came out with us, and and I, uh, as, as usual, I what it was was me uh, following her around like a puppy dog and trying to get her to you know to jump the fence with me and go uh, and do some damage, and then it wasn't happening. So uh, that was fine. Uh, so I then decided, you know what, I'm 22, and uh, there's a girl uh, that I would love to uh, be with, and I can't, so I'm just gonna drink. So I went ahead and drank. And I uh, I drank a ton and uh, and I actually got drunk, uh, shockingly. And uh, and uh, let me tell you, I, when you're drunk, you do not stay in your dance box. <laughs> I was I was all over the place. And uh, we went to a, there was a club called Turtles, and uh, there was a club uh, called Lily's. Unbelievably, there was a Woo! dance place, Lily's Saloon, and we would go there and dance. And then uh, I was drunk. And then inevitably, when we would come home, we would hit Seven Eleven for uh, chocolate milk and pecan twists and microwave burritos. And uh, and that's why I'm uh, a huge fat guy now. So, but at the time, I was dancing all the time, lifting, and I was—I mean, I looked uh, pretty good. So uh, instead, I was drunk, and I was like, "I just—I'm uh, going to go home." So I went, I got home, and uh, Ransom dropped me off. He was nice enough because I—I I didn't have a car at the time. I was always with him, and he went back out. So I was drunk, and uh, I was in my house. It was my birthday, and I had no uh, lady with me, and I was sad, and uh, and I was pining hard for this uh, other woman. That uh, and so I said, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna call a phone sex line. <laughs> it's my birthday, and I don't care. It's my present to myself, and I'm drunk. I'm gonna call phone sex, and I'm gonna see what the, I'm gonna do. With that so <laughs> I get all and I don't know what to do. All right, so I'm drunk in my house, and it's that weird kind of, you know, I because I, I will tell you this: I didn't have a phone in my room. <laughs> So I have to make the phone sex call from the living room. Oh my God. And uh, and so in my head, I'm like, all right, well, am I going to, like, do I have to jerk off? If I jerk off out here, like, 
I gotta lock the door to make sure Ransom doesn't walk in on me. That would be fucking horrendous. Like the, that's the last thing I need. But I'm, but again, I'm loaded, so I'm, I'm kind of got this weird thought process where I'm like, all right, I gotta call the phone, Zex. But I don't want to do it out here. But I gotta do it out here. But I'm all excited. So uh, I, I lock the door. And, uh, again, it's my birthday, folks. I can do whatever I want. I can call a phone sex line if I want to. So uh, I, I got to get prepared. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So uh, I, uh, I, <laughs> I take my pants off, but I don't take them all the way off because in my head I'm thinking, what if Ransom comes in? I got to have him still on. So I basically drop my pants to my ankles. Okay. I'm, I'm getting ready. Like, I, I don't even know what it's about, but I figure I'm going to jerk off, right? That's what you do with a phone sex line. So I'm ready. I'm, I'm, it's a birthday jerk off, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to go with it. So uh, uh, I grab the phone, and uh, I'm uh, the only phone sex line. Again, at the time, I the only phone sex line I know of is like it's like you know at the time they're nine hundred numbers, okay, and it was like one nine hundred da 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 fuck was like the only line that I could remember because we used to joke about it all the time. So uh, I grab the phone, and uh, I'm sitting there. I got my pants around my ankles, and I'm on our you know, leather couch, which I, I got to tell you, that's fantastic, folks. If you're <laughs> bare ass on a leather couch, there is nothing more comfortable. Uh, but the good news is if I go off, you know, uh, uh, if, I, if, if the phone sex achieves what it's supposed to achieve, it's an easy cleanup on the leather couch. Uh, not that I realize that. Again, I'm fucking loaded. I have no idea what's happening. I, I don't even know what to do. So I then I'm holding the phone and then I lay down on the leather couch, like with my pants at my ankles. I'm like I'm like laying down with the phone, and so I go to dial and uh, uh, and it's I, I should tell you by the way I have every light in my house off. Every light in my house is completely off because I don't want again if if ransom comes in I at least got to have the cover of night to hide the fact that I'm fucking jerking off in the living room. So uh, so I've got everything off, and I'm, I'm ready, and i got my pants down on my ankles. So I, I go to dial, and I dial uh, 1-900-FUCK. And uh, it rings, and, uh, and I'm standing there. And so then I don't know if I'm supposed to start jerking off now <laughs> because I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So uh, And also, I should tell you, uh, again, I'm loaded. I'm dialing this number. I have no idea what it costs. I, I don't I don't even think about it. I'm just like I'm it's my birthday. It's my present to myself. I'm bummed because the girl that I want I can't have and the girl that I'm banging I can't have because she's home with her fucking husband. So <laughs> I'm like, fuck it. I'm just diving headlong into this phone sex. I've I've thought about it long enough. We've joked about it long enough. So uh the phone rings and I'm sitting there and I go, you know what, I, I need to start up. So I just start up. And uh they answer the phone and uh, uh hello? It's a man. A man answers the phone. And I go, hello? And he goes, hey, what's happening? Or no, uh, what's going on? He says, hey, what's going on? And I'm, I'm, I got to tell you, you know, I got my cock in one hand and the phone in the other. <laughs> and I'm talking to a guy. And I go, nothing. What's going on with you? <laughs> and he goes, nothing. I'm just sitting here. And then I go, who is this? And he says, this is Sky. <laughs> and it dawns on me that the woman that I have the big crush on, that I'm friends with her family and her kids, her oldest son is Sky. In the fucking middle of the night, drunk, to call phone sex line, I drunk dial her house. <gasps> At 2 in the morning, as I'm laying on the couch, I got my cock in one hand, I got the phone in the other, and I get her fucking 15-year-old son on the phone. And he says, this is Sky." And I go, oh, Sky, oh, dude, it's Mike. And he goes, hi, Mike. And I go, man, I can't. I can't believe I called. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm like covering up, like I throw a pillow over my cock. Like, he can't even see me, but I think that he can, like... I, you know, but now I'm talking to a 15-year-old boy and I'm half naked with my dick in my hand. I'm like, come on, seriously? Not only that, he's the son of the woman that I have this huge crush on. And I, I again, I'm fucking drunk and I'm like, I'm just like, oh, oh, Sky. Oh, it's Mike, man. And he goes, hi, Mike. And I go, ah, yeah. You know, I, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you. And he goes, do you want me to suck your cock? And, and I'm like, what did you say? And he goes, do you want me to suck your cock, Mike? And I go, oh, my God, no, Sky, what are you saying? Don't say that. 
And he goes, no, I'm serious. He goes, you, you, I'll suck your cock, and then you can, and, and, he, and he says, and I'll spare you, but the filthiest fucking, I mean, just the most, dis- I mean, horrible things that you could ever imagine. He just starts saying it. And I go, oh, no, Sky, why are you, what are you saying these things? Like, I'm, again, I'm drunk. I should just hang up the phone. I should just hang up the phone, but now drunk me with, you know, half a heart on his hand. All of a sudden, this guy, he's got his, the 15-year-old son of the woman that he, that he is crushing on starts coming on to him on the phone in the middle of the night. And I lose my mind. I, I just like, well, no, Sky, no, don't say I almost cry. Like, I'm like so sad. I can't believe it's come to this. I, I can't believe I called him and bothered him. But then he drops this. I mean, and he is f- just talking a filthy blue streak. He doesn't stop. And I'm just going, no, stop. No, Sky, Sky, don't talk. Sky, is your mom there? Is your mom there? Come on. Don't do this. Is, is, is your mom there? And he just, he's, he won't stop talking. He's fucking filthy. And again, so I literally... Like, I roll and I fall off the couch. Like, because I'm so, like, I'm freaking, it's, like, so creepy. And it's got me so weirded out. Like, I just, and I don't know what to do. And so I just, I reach over and I just slam the phone down. Like, I slam the phone. And then I'm just, I'm laying on the ground, half naked, you know, like, fucking ass in the air on my hands and knees. And, like, slam the phone out. And I'm just like, oh. Oh, my God. Oh, that was, I mean, that was just awful. I'm like, it was just, it was awful. I, I don't know why. Why is he? Why did he say that? It was terrible. So I I stagger. I get up, and stupid me. I I get up and I try to walk into my room. My pants are on my ankles. I stagger and fall. And instead, I'm drunk. So instead of pulling my pants up, I'm staggering, half naked to the room, like and just like still bewildered. I can't believe what happened. And uh and then I just go into my into the room and I just fucking pass out. I go to sleep. I don't even get undressed, like pants around my ankles, fucking just fall asleep in the bed. So the next day, I get up, and uh, and I'm just, I'm freaked out, because I remember, you know, I remember what happened. And uh, and I'm supposed to have lunch with this woman the next day. And I don't, I don't have any idea what I'm going to say or do. She's picking me up at like 2. So I get up, and I get a shower, and I'm just sitting there. I'm just, I'm freaked out. I can't believe it. And Ransom comes home, you know, he, he comes out, he's like, hey, what happened to you last night? I go, oh, dude, don't even ask what happened to me last night. He goes, well, I dropped you off, and then you were you were here. You, he goes, uh, you kept saying you had to make a phone call. And I'm like, yeah. I kept saying I had to make a phone call. <laughs> he goes, well, did you make your phone? I go, yeah. He goes, well, I, yeah, you did, because the phone was off the hook. Like, he goes, he goes, I don't know what you did, but the phone was like, completely off the hook and the and he goes the, and the the couch cushions were off and i'm like yeah i i kind of like i was drunk he's like yeah okay because again it was that thing where we all it was that you could get away with anything because you just go yeah i was drunk and everybody just go yeah okay uh so i guess when I, in my haste um i had slammed the phone down but not on the phone i had just slammed it on the table like like that was hanging it up <laughs> and you know what wham I, i'm done with you uh so, and then I had staggered off and d- destroyed the couch and then went to bed. And uh, and didn't even get to jerk off, by the way. I-, I should mention that. Happy birthday to me. I didn't even get to fucking run off a batch. Because uh, because I'll be honest with you, I, I don't, uh, I- I'm sure I would have gotten whiskey dick anyway at 22. But uh, uh, but still, after what had happened, I-, I might not even get it up for the rest of the year. Seriously, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to have a hard on for uh, at least... I'm going to say at least until 1990 at that point, because that's July of 89. So that, oh, and Jesus, I mean, that's 20 years ago, right? That's, oh my God, am I old? All right, this this happened 20 years ago. <laughs> Good Christ. And uh, so I was like, all right, so I, 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 I staggered to bed, went to sleep, didn't even jerk off, nothing. Happy birthday. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, Katie's coming to pick me up for, for lunch. And I'm like, uh, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to face this chick. I, I don't know. I mean, after what her son said to me the night before, like, I don't even, it, he never even, look, I've seen him a lot. He never even hinted that he liked me that much. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, sure, we got along in a, hey, what's happening in your mom home type of way, but I never knew he had, uh, he had those sort of feelings for me. It seemed really odd and crazy. And uh, I don't know if he just decided on my birthday he was going to let it all go at one in the morning. I don't fucking know. So... Uh, but that's fine. So I'm like, all right, I I don't, I don't have any idea what I'm going to say to her. So she pulls up and, uh, and I go outside and I, and I, I, again, I'm, I don't know what to say because it's, 
I also I also come from you know a background of my mom trapping me like my mom my mom knowing I ditched school and going hey how was school today and I go oh school was fine wham hit in the face with the spatula I was at that goddamn school today well <laughs> this time uh, I, I'm waiting for Katie to go you know hey what's happening and I'll go nothing and she'll go uh, uh, so uh, do you want to go by and see the kids you know what I mean like I'm waiting for that to come out because that that's gonna be horrible because I don't know I don't know what to say. Uh, so I just, I, I don't say anything. That's what I decide to do. <laughs> I, I just, uh, uh, you know, as I've said many times, I lay under the coats and hope everything goes away. So I get in the car and she's like, uh, uh, let's, you know, she wants to go have lunch. And I live on the, I should tell you, I live on the California side of Lake Tahoe. She lives on the Nevada side. Uh, so I was like, well, where are we going for lunch? She's like, well, you know what? Actually, um, I have to go back to the house first and then we can go out for lunch. And I'm like, Oh, I, um, I go, well, why don't you just go home and then pick me up, like come back and get me? She's like, don't be stupid. You're, we're, we're here now. We'll just, we'll go to my house and then we'll eat on the Nevada side. And I'm like, I don't, uh, nah, <laughs> I don't think I want to. She goes, well, and I go, look, it's, it's, you know, can't we just call it like my second birthday lunch and I, I get to pick. So, and she's like, no, you can't. She goes, I'm going to go home and then we'll go. She goes, I'm not going to double back. It, it's stupid. So just come with me. So we got to drive across town. And the whole time in the in the Jeep, I'm just sitting there going, I don't, what the hell am I going to say to Sky when I see him? Even worse, what's Sky going to say to me when he sees me? I mean, I already know what the kid is capable of. I don't think I want to go ahead and have this dropped in my lap again. Is it gonna, it's going to be creepy. Like, we're going to go in the house. He's not going to say anything. And then, like, she's going to go in the other room, and he's just going to kind of, like, wink at me or something. Oh, God. And, again, he's 15. Like, this is this is all breaking horribly bad. And I, I'm, I'm you know, secretly in love with his mom. It's just awful. I can't even explain how horrible this is. So I'm just, it's the worst ride. In it. I'm nauseous because, again, I'm sort of hungover anyway. And, uh, and now I'm in the Jeep just, I, 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 I'm sick. I can't go to her house. So I keep going, well, you know what? You know what? Can you drop me off at Caesars? I got to make a bet on some baseball, and then you can pick me up. She's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> we'll go to my house, and then we'll, and that'll be fine. Just you, we'll, we'll, I just got to pick something up. So we get to her house, and uh, she's like, come on in, because I got to make a phone call, too. And I go, I'll wait in the car. And she's like, come on in. So I go in the house, and I walk in, and uh, I, I, two of her, her two youngest are in the living room. And I see them. And they're like, hey, Mike. And I go, hey, is Sky around? <laughs> and they go, yeah, he's upstairs. We'll get him. And they just start running up the stairs. I'm like, no, don't get him. I don't need to talk to him ever again. <laughs> but this is like little kids. You know, like, yeah, we'll get him. They just run away. I'm like, oh, no. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I, don't, I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't, I'm fucking freaking out. I have no interest in talking to him, seeing him. I don't even want to be in the house. I, you know, if I didn't love his mom so much, I would have just, I would have canceled lunch and never seen her again. It was so freaking weird. So they come running downstairs, and Sky comes down. And I, I look at him, and I, can, I can barely look at him. And he just goes, hey, Mike, what's up? And I go, Nothing. What's up with you? He goes, nothing. He goes, I heard you got drunk last night. And I go, yeah. Who told you that? And he goes, my mom. Like, I, mean, like, I guess, because I'm thinking he heard it on the phone. You know what I mean? Like, I have no idea. And, and I go, who told you that? He goes, my mom. And I go, oh, did I sound drunk? Like, and I don't even know why I said it. It's like, now I know that he, like, in case it was ever going to just hang there, now I've, I've revealed that I talked to him. He goes, what do you mean? Did I did you sound drunk? And I go, well, did I sound drunk on the phone? And now it's out there. Like I didn't want him to have it out there, but I just said it. Like I just, because I didn't know what I was gonna do, and now I'm just, because I now I figure, you know what? Confront it head on. Just fucking confront it head on. And uh, I said, did I sound drunk on the phone? He goes, I didn't talk. To, when did you talk to me on the phone? I said, I talked to you last night on the phone, Sky. He goes, <laughs> and he starts laughing. And I go, what? And he goes, I didn't talk to you last night on the phone. And I go, Sky, I talked to you last night on the phone. You don't remember talking to me on the phone? Like in the middle of the night? And he goes, man, you must have been really drunk. <laughs> and I go, dude, I I talked to you last night. Like, didn't I, I called here in the middle of the night. And I, I, I uh, and he goes, why would you call here in the middle of the night? And I go, well, I, uh, it was, I accidentally misdialed. I was going to call, uh, somebody else. And I think I accidentally called your house, but I talked to you. He goes, dude, no, I, I wasn't even home last night. 
he had he has a friend and he goes, I was sleeping over at my friend's house. And I went, oh, you're sure I didn't call you last night? <laughs> he goes, yeah, I'm positive. I wasn't even here. And I went, oh, okay. So I, I, I guess I didn't talk to him. It was the weirdest. I, look, so I had no idea what the hell was going on. So I, I, I went, all right. So Katie came downstairs and I said to her, I was like, well, you know, let's go to lunch and and uh, and we talked about what had happened the previous night. And I go, let me ask you something. I go, what time did you get home last night? She goes, oh, I get home around like 2.30. I said, was Sky here? She goes, no, he stayed over at his friend's house. I go, so he wasn't home last night. She said, no, why? She goes, did you come over here? I go, well, no, I left you at the bar. Ransom brought me home, and then I went home. And I called here in the middle of the night. She goes, well, you didn't talk to Sky if you called here. Now, the only other person that I could think of was her husband. But I don't think her husband would pose as her 15-year-old son and then say he wanted to blow me. It's the weirdest. <laughs> so now I, I'm completely fucking confused. Now I'm thinking I'm drunk and I made the whole thing up in my brain. Like, I have no idea what happened. Except for I know that I destroyed the couch. I, you know, took all the couch cushions off and I hung the phone up on the coffee table. I have no idea what happened. So I go, all right. So we go to lunch and I forget about it. I don't even think about it. That's fine. So Happy birthday. Uh, I made some weird, like I had some weird hallucinatory dream on the phone, and I don't, and I wound up talking to a guy who wanted to have sex with me. It was the like I don't even know how you make that up. How drunk do you have to be that you make up a sex phone call with a guy? Like it's the it was weird, and then it's like I'm sure it's all sorts of Freudian bullshit. I don't even want to think about what it meant. So I'm just like freaked out. I'm like, all right, so. Uh, uh, you know, days go by, I live my life and, uh, everything's fine. I, and I, it's funny. I even joke about it at the ransom. I go, dude, I must've been loaded the night of my birthday. And he's like, no kidding. And, uh, uh, I said, I thought I, I, I wound up calling, uh, someone and it turns out I didn't even call him. But I don't tell him what it was, by the way. I, I gotta tell you, I don't tell <laughs> ransom. Hey, by the way, I called a guy and I want to fucking him. I mean, it's like, like, it's like. Because it's bad enough what ha- I I know what happened in my brain. It was so bad. Like I blush now, even like thinking about it. Like it was so. I mean, just brutal. So that's fine. So I mean, it's a mystery. I go. I, I don't even know what the fuck's gonna happen. A couple weeks go by, and uh, I come home from work one night, and uh, Ransom's there, and he goes, "Dude, I gotta talk to you." I go, what's up? And he goes, well, uh, you know, we got to do the bills and all that. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine because I got to pay the bills. And it's funny. It's at this time that I'm planning to move uh, down to Los Angeles. I've actually been spent sending money to my brother and all sorts of stuff. So uh, it's time. Uh, and he goes, all right, well, we got to divvy up the bills. And he goes, uh, did you see the phone bill? I said, no, I didn't see it. He goes, you might want to take a look at it. So he gives me the phone bill. And uh, the phone bill... <laughs> is like $340. Now, our bill's normally like 100 bucks, give or take. It's $345. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck? Who did you call that the, the bill's this high? He goes, I didn't call anybody. Who did you call that the bill's this high? I said, what do you mean? He goes, it had to be you, dude. It wasn't me. So he gives me the phone. He goes, look at this. He goes, and, and the phone bill looks normal. It looks normal. We go down. There's a charge on the phone for a 900 number. <laughs> In the wee hours of July 30th. Uh, it was a 48-minute phone call. At three ninety nine a minute, for a total of one hundred ninety one dollars and fifty two cents. Uh, apparently, when I hung the phone up on the coffee table, didn't disconnect the call at all. And Sky uh, kept the phone meter running and charged me. Now. I owe $191 for this phone call. And I look at him and I go, what? I said, I didn't make that call. He goes, you must have made that call. You told me you call, you made a phone call in the middle of the night. And then the phone was on the coffee table. It had to be you. 
I said, yeah, but I said, all right, I tried to call a phone sex line and I did not get a phone sex line. I got a guy <laughs> saying hello. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like, ta-da, you've called a phone sex line. It was a man who answered and said hello. I go, and I didn't call, a, 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 I called, you know, 1-900-whatever-fuck. And I thought that was girls on the commercial. It's girls. <laughs> and he looks at the number and he goes, well, that's, that's not 1-900-fuck. And he gets the phone and we look at it. And uh, it was the F and the C and the K. Uh but also, when you look at your phone on the three, it doesn't just have an E and an F. There's a D. <laughs> and I didn't dial a U. I was drunk in the dark. I hit an I. I called 1-900-DICK. <laughs> and it cost me $192. <laughs> And that was the guy on the phone, and his name was Sky. So for a fucking month, I thought the 15-year-old son, who has a name, believe me, who in the world is named Sky? Nobody. That's why I said, I mean, it's the fucking weirdest coincidence of all time. I mean, Katie's son is named Sky. Nobody's named Sky. Nobody. Nobody. But in the middle of the night, in the dark, drunk with my pants around my ankles, I went to call 1-900-FUCK, I dialed 1-900-DICK, and I got a guy who shares a name with the oldest son of the woman that I want to bang in this, in this town. And I freak out, I put the phone down and let the meter run, and it cost me 192 fucking dollars. So I don't care what happens tonight. It's not going to be the worst birthday or certainly not the most expensive birthday I've ever had. Huh? See, I told you earlier there was a story that I, I was going to jerk off to, and then I ended with a story that I jerked off in. How about that, folks? Enjoy that. I like to go with a jerk-off bookend every now and again. I, 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 you know what I call them? A bookend jerk-off. That's what I call them. I don't go jerk off bookend because that's weird. It's like you're jerking off the bookends. No, bookend jerk off. That means you got jerk off in parentheses. A jerk off parentheses. Uh, <laughs> not the name of the show. Jerk off parentheses? Why not? Damn it. I think we already have the name of the show, but I'm not sure. Lily, look, she compiles a list. Uh, it's a lot more difficult for her to do when one of her hands is jammed into the fucking computer like she's Tron. But other than that, it seems to be okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to give you this little inside baseball really quickly. Um, this is episode nine. And I'm recording it before I record episode eight. Uh, so this was kind of easy to do because it's just like these little segments and stuff. Well, episode eight, that's going to be a real episode where I'm actually talking and she's going to have to hold the fucking thing into the, the laptop. We, I don't even know how it's going to work. Dude, episode eight. So let, let, go ahead and accept my apology right now for episode eight, whatever it turns out to be. <laughs> And also, if there's any audio problems or anything like that, I'm sorry, man, but we're trying. I mean, we, something's up with her computer, and we got to go to the Genius Bar. But uh, unfortunately, she's about to go to Hawaii and jump into Diamond Head, and I'm about to go to Milwaukee and jump into a volcano filled with cheese and beer, because that's what they have there. If they have a volcano, I have no idea. But if, I, l let's be honest. If Milwaukee has a volcano, it's filled with cheese and beer. There can't be any doubt. So there could be audio stuff going on. If there is, I apologize. And also, again, I don't know what episode eight is going to be like because we're about to do it. So well, who the fuck knows what's going to happen? Uh, you guys can get me at MikeAndMikeSchmidtComedy.com. You guys can be my friend at Facebook.com slash The 40-Year-Old Boy. You can follow me at Twitter.com slash The 40-Year-Old Boy. Uh, our friend David Hernandez, who really should have worked this week. Um, he should have been here on the microphone. He should have handled it. He should have held it down. He should have been the Alan Freed of this week's show. He should have come in here and spun some of the platters that matter, but he did not. Instead, he stayed home and painted in a dark room um, and then composed more music. Uh, we should just add a music. I should just play like Mex's album this week. Like all uh, just another, you know, let's play the interlude again. Let's just do that. Let's fucking release it. We should release the interlude. Shouldn't we do that? We should. The yes. Release the interlude, Kraken. Release the Kraken interlude. Release the jerk off parentheses. 
Uh, our friend David Hernandez, you can be his friend at facebook.com slash David Mex Hernandez. And uh, if you'd like to hire him to do some artwork for you, you can go to artbydmh.com. That's A-R-T-B-Y-D-M-H.com and commission him to do any sort of painting or artwork that you would want him to do. And he's happy to do just that because he's amazing and he will take care of it. Um, our friend Lily Von Stupp is the producer of this show and, uh, and she is... Uh, I think all of the years of giving hand jobs have come in handy because her, her strong hand is holding in this uh, plug, and it's great. Um, you want come on, let's face it, you're the clicks into the podcast world, right? Oh no! All right, uh, Google clicks in. You won't be disappointed. You know what? Don't do it at work. Um, <laughs> So, Lily Von Stupp is available uh, at several different Twitter accounts. Uh, Twitter.com slash Lily Von Stupp. Twitter.com slash MNTs. Twitter.com slash Hollywood BQ Fest. Uh, and you can also be your friend at Facebook.com slash Lily Von Stupp. But if you'd like to write her a personal note uh, and find out uh, which hand she actually has to use to hold in the plug on the laptop. <laughs> is she sound dexterous? Who knows? You can ask her in a note when you write her at Lily at burlesque411.com. That's Lily, L-I-L-I, at burlesque411.com. want to remind you folks about the Monday Night Tees every Monday night at the three clubs on Vine at Santa Monica. Our friend Lily Von Stuff puts together an amazing show every single week there. Uh, she's here right now. Hey, Lily, how are you? I'm great, Mike. How's your hand? It's awesome. Oh, it's held in place, and hopefully the audio continues to work. Oh, man, by the way, I fucked up my knee. Like, uh, did I tell you I was running upstairs, and I, I was running up stone stairs? You know those stone stairs you see in an apartment complex? I hear they're like, they're, it's literally just gravel welded with cement. Um, well, I... I I shouldn't tell it. You know, I'll talk about this in episode eight. Okay. All right. You guys heard this last week. Because um, I said, I just told Lily, I go, I'm going to blaze through these plugs so you don't have to hold that thing in. And uh, and sure enough, here I am fucking talking like an idiot. All right. I was going to tell it. I'll tell the rock story in episode eight. Not rock, stone, stairs, knee. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, how's the Monday Night Tees going, Lily? Wonderful. You had some Japanese people there a couple of weeks ago, and you've got all sorts of stuff happening. Shows are available. If you go to Facebook.com slash Brown Paper Tickets, that's incorrect. If you go to Facebook.com slash Monday Night Tees, you can become a friend of the show and find out all the people who are coming and all of the shows that are going to be there in the future. Go to BrownPaperTickets.com and you can go ahead and purchase tickets for that. And uh, this is airing. Have you already performed in Hawaii? Or are you still just vacationing in Hawaii? What's the? Uh, I've already performed. You've already performed. How great? How how'd it go? Fantastic. You were amazing. I was. I was. Of course you did. Diamond had erupted. <laughs> it hasn't erupted in years, and boom, lava all over the goddamn island because of you. You came there, you were so hot, you rubbed up against it, and boom, lava. Uh, so perfect, good for you. So Hawaii went well. You're there now. You're still enjoying some pineapple. You're enjoying some uh, tropical insects, and uh, you'll be back soon. And next week we're live. We're 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 live evil like Ozzy Osbourne. Um, <laughs> I don't know. We could be. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, so that's our friend Lily Bunch. But again, be her friend at Facebook and all those things. Follow her on Twitter and go to the Monday Night Tees page at facebook.com slash Monday Night Tees and go ahead and get yourself all the information about upcoming shows. Go to Brown Paper Tickets and buy those tickets and uh, enjoy the show and come and join us. It'll be fun. Uh, as I mentioned, you can go be Max's friend and uh, I mentioned artbydmh.com. Go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com and go to the Joe Business page. All sorts of cool stuff there for sale. The uh, yeah, dirt, dirt shirts are available. We just sold a bunch, weirdly. Uh, our friend, uh, was it Lee Estall in England? Uh, if you don't have it yet, I sent it three weeks ago because we're recording this. But <laughs> but just so you know, I did send it. I'm current. If you ordered stuff, I'm current. Uh, our friend K. Joe, Catherine Johnson in Toronto, t- t- wrote me a note. And she's like, it's so funny. Like, people are awesome. 
because they want to help the show and they want to buy stuff. And she's like, I want to buy this stuff, but I can't do it this way. And because she, she's, she's in a different country and PayPal and I don't fucking know the rules. The Internet is fucking weird. So she's like, what if I did this? Would it work if I did this? And I said, yeah. And then she wrote me back. And she's like, I can't do that yet because they're telling me I got to do this. And so, again, this is three weeks ago. So we, we could all be fixed. And honestly, me and Kjo, we could be married by now. I have no idea what the fuck happened. Seriously, this is three weeks ago. I can't predict the future or the past. <laughs> So, but if you go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com and go to the Joe Business page, again, there's the yurt, dirt, dirt shirt, there's the Big Angry CD, there's the For the Life of Schmitty single, there is the Schmitty Comes Alive special, there is uh, TweakedAudio.com, always present on the page. Uh, our good friend Mike Yoder just bought some stuff from Tweaked Audio. Thank you so much for supporting Tweaked Audio because they support us. And, uh, oh, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, and year six of this show are available now. Uh, individually or you can get them as part of the Reservoir Schmidt Dogs box set available now go ahead and pick it up and uh, check that out on the page just for the artwork alone look at it it's fun because Mex designed it and it's fantastic and I love it and now we gotta go ice down Lily's hand I mean I, I just seriously like I, I told her I'm gonna blaze through these plugs and we're gonna get you out of here and we're gonna square this away because we still have a full episode to do and she's gonna have to hold the fucking plug in and I dude I have no idea how that's gonna work I, and it just and I, I know talking now isn't really helping, so you know what? Let's just fade it. Turn the music on and get me out of here because it's like, I, and I know, and I mean, you guys are here and you're waiting, and you already, you don't want to hear me describe episode eight because episode eight already aired. You heard it last week, so there's no reason for me to go into what episode eight's going to be like. I'm talking about the audio and stuff like that because you already know that there were audio dropouts. And again, also in episode eight, I talked a lot about the fact that Lily had to hold the microphone plug in. So I don't know why I love that. Now. Literally, this show starts as a tiny snowball, and at the end, the hundreds are dead at the bottom of a ravine. I mean, I get that. Believe me, if there's any show in the history of the world that does not need to be transcribed for posterity, it's this one. I like times, I like when nobody can see the seams. I like when I'm able to kind of just, you know, fly with the bees wherever. When I have to actually stop the bees and ask for directions, that's not fun. I just like unleashing the bees, but when the bees have to stop in mid-flight and we all have to kind of look at each other and bust out a fucking map, that's not fun at all. I want to saddle up these bees and ride, goddammit! Done. 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 Done.